Welcome to the Monday, March 12th, Hill the Hills Board of Commissioners meeting. Call this meeting to order. Thank you all for attending. Um, first item, if you'll please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. for a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Before we keep moving forward with our agenda, I'll let you know um, Commissioner Rebottom sends her regrets. She um, is under the weather this evening, which is why she's not here with us tonight. With that, we will move on to our next item on the agenda, uh, which is the agenda approval. Is there a motion? Motion to be approved the agenda as presented. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please signal saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great, thank you. Okay, next up, we have one public hearing this evening, and our town attorney will walk us through the public hearing. Thank you, Mayor. I'll go over a couple of the finer details about our hearing tonight. Uh, public notice of the hearing was published in the newspaper and posted on the town bulletin boards in accordance with statutory requirements for the subject matter. A copy of this notice has also been filed with the town clerk for entry into the official record of the hearing. The town clerk will record all oral comments in a concise and brief manner. These written statements shall be recorded in a similar manner and made a part of the record of the hearing and shall be submitted in full to the town clerk. If speaking tonight, please limit your comments to matters relevant to the issue and to a time period of three minutes unless you are speaking for a group. In that case, a five-minute exception will be given. All speakers, please come to the microphone so that your statement may be taped. There shall be no deba debates, and please identify yourself and your address as you come forward. All right, this public hearing will please come to order. This hearing is called for the purpose of the Kildoba Hills Board of Commissioners to consider Nature's Walk, Conditional Use Site Plan, it's a workforce housing, multifamily development located at 901 9th Avenue in the Light Industrial 1 Zoning District. Uh, it's to modify Phase 2, two four-unit structures and associated site improvements. Right. Uh, I don't have anybody on the public hearing comment sign-up sheet. Uh, is there anybody from the audience who would like to speak on this issue? All right. Will there be no further... I did hear none, correct? There being no further public comment on this item, at this time the Board of Commissioners will conduct discussion and make their own comments prior to the public hearing being closed and action taken by the Board. Thank you. Okay. Comments, discussion, questions? Yeah, looks like we've looked at it before. We've seen it a couple times. It's a pretty clean site plan, and I think they did a real good job of presenting it. Would be in order. I make a motion we approve the uh, Nature's Walk continue uh, continue conditional use site plan workforce housing multifamily development 901 9th Avenue light industrial one zone district modified phase two two four unit structures and associated site improvements. Is there a second? Okay. All those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry. Is there any other discussion or comments? All those in favor, please say saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. All right. Next on our agenda is the first time set aside this evening for public comment. Uh, we have two opportunities during the Cuddle Hills meetings. Um, this is an opportunity for anyone who wishes to speak on any topic to do so. Uh, we do ask if you're speaking at public comment if you would approach the podium when called upon. If you're speaking as an individual, we ask that you keep your comments to approximately three minutes. If you're speaking on behalf of a group, we ask you to keep those comments to five minutes just to respect the time and moving forward with the meeting. Um, we had one individual sign up, so we'll start with this individual. But if you didn't sign up, no worries, then we'll call from the floor. Um, so first, this evening, we have um, Ms. Trudy Gardner. Is that correct? Welcome. Can you 
you all hear me okay? My name is Trudy Lee Gardner. My husband and I live at 2027 South Virginia Dare Trail on the ocean. We are directly across from the First Flight Hotel, which is now under construction. When I spoke to the PDH Planning Board in October of 2016, at that meeting, there were several concerns raised about pedestrian safety with all of the tenants at the hotel crossing the beach road. The original plans called for a restaurant with ocean access at 2029 South Virginia Bear Trail and 2031 South Virginia Bear Trail. Both of those lots are now listed for sale. I understand that the planning board has apparently been told that whichever lot sells first, the other one may be a beach access. There is no guarantee of this, and we are aware of that. We are also aware that the town cannot simply mandate a beach access for a property on the west side of the beach road. I am very concerned about the possibility of 300 to 500 people crossing that beach road in the summertime with no designated access. We reach this number because the hotel will have 152 rooms. Some of these, and most of these, are intended to be suites with one to six persons per suite. Since the closest public access is 8th Street, which is 500 feet to the south, this raises the potential for a great deal of trespassing. We would really appreciate any suggestions this board may offer, and we thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak at this public comment time? Anyone else? Any hands? Um, we'll move next then to response to public comment. Um, Ms. Gardner, thank you and your husband for being here and sharing your concerns with us. Um, I'll have to defer to any of the commissioners or town staff if we have any input at this point. Otherwise, for me, I know you brought something up that I'll need to do some homework on and, and look into, but I don't know if anyone has any comments that they'd be prepared off the fly. No, yeah. we can look into it. Then we will follow back up directly with you and we'll provide an update at our next meeting just to take this into consideration and see what, like you said, what we can look into as options or what's really happening with this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, we will move on then to introductions and presentations. Excuse me. Yes. Mike Robinson, the engineer for the hotel. If you would like him to respond to Ms. Gardner's, um, if, if he has any information and feels comfortable, sure. great. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. He, that, I think that's why he came. Oh, well, wonderful. Actually, that was for nature's walk. Oh, nature's walk. Okay, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know? Okay. He's here. So, Ms. Gardner, I don't know if you heard that, but the engineer on the yes. project, so great. Mike, thank you for being willing to jump up and share with us. Oh, it's not a problem. Um, when we originally did the site plan, we had two oceanfront lots across from the hotel. And on that, we had kind of a grandiose scheme to do a restaurant, swimming pool, beach access. From a financial perspective, the developer could not get anybody that was interested in, in the restaurant. Surprise to me, I thought it would be a huge success. So what he has opted to do, and we are getting ready to bring that back to staff, is he wants to take the southern lot of the two, and we're going to do a much scaled down swimming pool, beach access, deck type of, of facility over there. But with 100% with certainty, I can tell you that there will be a beach access. And there, the, the hotel needs an oceanfront access to be successful. The owner recognizes that. Um, he's got, like I say, he's got one house that's still there. We might still end up using both the lots, but without... With 100% certainty, I can tell you we're going to at least use the southern lot of the two. Right now, probably leave the house that's there in place. Thank you so much. That's great. Enlightening to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional information the board needs to survive? I 
think that covers where we are now then. Does that suffice your question for now? And then as we receive any yeah. other updates. Anything changes, we'll let you know. Michael, let us know. We'll let you know. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Meredith. All right, we will then move on to introductions and presentations. Our first presenta presentation this evening is from the superintendent of um, our park service here, Dave Halleck. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Here. He's going to give us kind of a year in review look for 2017. So welcome, Dave. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So this is meant to be just a brief snapshot of what transpired over the year 2017 at both uh, Cape, at all three Cape Hatteras National Seashore, Port Raleigh National Historic Site, and Wright Brothers National Memorial. I have the distinct pleasure of having the opportunity to manage those three sites and uh, continuing to really enjoy that. So, can I control that? Look at that. Thank you. Uh, real brief rundown on the three park units. Uh, you're probably familiar with Fort Raleigh National Historic Site. That's where our headquarters office is. Fort Raleigh is a site with about 450 acres, and we'll talk about visitation there in a few minutes. Right across the street from here is Wright Brothers National Memorial, also about a 450-acre park with quite a few visitors, and then Cape Hatteras Seashore starting at Whalebone Junction, extending almost 70 miles to the tip of Ochre Coast. So in total, last year, we had over 3 million visits, something for us to all re be really proud of here in Dare County. These are numbers that approach the type of visitation that you expect to see in what they call the crown jewel parks, places like Glacier, places like Grand Teton National Park. So obviously, these three park units do represent uh, one of the jewels of the National Park Service. Uh, we have... 79 year-round staff, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how we make ends meet and how we get things done. About 100 seasonal staff that come in during the summertime, just like all of the businesses and other tourism-based uh, operations in the Outer Banks. 352 volunteers that contribute over 20,000 hours. We are so lucky to have that level of volunteer support. It represents really like 10 additional full-time staff throughout the year. Five visitor centers. We had 65,000 overnight camping stays last year in four different campgrounds, one of which is close by the Oregon Inlet Campground, north of Oregon Inlet. Over 200 public toilets. Our, our maintenance chief thinks that's important for me to tell you. Two water treatment plants, 60 septic systems, 84 parking lots, 230 buildings, and three airstrips. And we do all this, sorry, on a budget of uh, close to $15 million. We are extremely lucky to have funding from Congress of close to $10 million every year. And then we bring in an additional close to $5 million through other fees, such as lighthouse climbing, entrance fees at Wright Brothers, and off-road vehicle permit fees. So real quick rundown, what happened in terms of visitation? On the left-hand side of this graph, these are numbers of visits, and you can see the bottom is 150000 Fort Raleigh National Historic Site was similar to the level of visitation over the last five years with about 270,000 visits. Down 6% from last year, I would call that basically flat. Wright Brothers down 10% at just over 400,000 visits. Most likely the decline in visitation is a result of the visitor center, which is currently under renovation. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. And then Cape Hatteras Seashore, also mostly flat, but a slight uptick at 1%. This is the highest level of visitation we have recorded in 14 years. And you, you'll note from 2014 through 2017, we're seeing a trend of increased visitation. It's particularly noteworthy because if you remember, there was a blackout that we had this last summer yeah. with almost one entire week on Hatteras and Ocracoke Island with very little visitation. <coughs> Uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the shoulder season. We're probably all noting that traffic is very, very busy uh, throughout the year now and that you know maybe our shoulder seasons are growing. Uh, these data indicate that that may be the case. November of 2017 was the highest visitation that we've had since 1998. Uh, and you can see the bar there in 2017. And you can also see since 2014 that the numbers appear to be going up a little bit. It's a challenge for us as uh, a tourism-based uh, industry here because our seasonal staff that come in can only work for six months. Uh, real quick, some other interesting trends. 
If you're talking about visitation to Ocracoke Island, which is, of course, in Hyde County, numbers have been going down dramatically. Numbers today are only uh, about 60% of what they were in the late 90s and early 2000s, most likely a result of the longer ferry route. These data give you a glimpse into the impact of the power line being cut during the last week of July. What I'm going to show you first in the blue here are the typical number of cars that we see in the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse parking lot. It's between 750 and 1,000 cars per day. And in 2017, this lighter co color bars here show that starting on the 29th, which was when the mandatory visitor evacuation started, for the rest of that week, we had about an 80 to 90 percent drop in the number of vehicles we recorded there. So this is just one indicator of the impact of that power line cut on visitation on Hatteras Island. 2017 was a warm year with average rainfall. This is one of the most popular questions we get. Was it a warm year, a cold year, rainy? Uh, these data are from the Billy Mitchell Airport in Frisco. So this looks like a lot of stuff and it looks confusing. I'll try to walk <laughs> you through it very, very quickly. The red bars are the maximum temperature. The gray bars are the minimum temperature. And we've recorded those monthly. And you'll notice it starts at zero. This is departure from the 30-year average. So if the bar goes up, it means that the temperature, the max and the min temperature, were warmer than the 30-year average. You'll note for basically every month across the board, other than maybe December, the temperatures were between uh, 2 and up to 8 degrees warmer in terms of a max and a min temperature. And the bars all the way on the right side of the graph are for the year on average. On average, we were 2 to 3 degrees warmer in terms of our max and min temperature. The lower graph is rainfall. The dashed line represents 100% of average rainfall. So if the, if the bar for January goes right up to about 100%, it was an average January. You can see the months fluctuate. October and November were only about 40% of average rainfall, and maybe that's what drove such high fall visitation. The last bar is the year total. We are spot on average rainfall here. That's just a few weeks ago. I like this photograph. Hard to believe we had 10 and a half inches of snow here. Uh, we had a great visitor uh, engagement over the last year. We gave almost 3,000 formal programs in the three park units, and almost 85,000 visitors had the opportunity to enjoy those programs. And we gave badges to almost 6,500 junior rangers. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the exciting things that happened, some of the challenges, and some of our future challenges. Uh, this is Shelly Island. I got to uh, be on All Things Considered to talk about Shelly Island. <laughs> kind of fun when you get to do things like that for three minutes. It was a little bit nerve-wracking. Uh, my dad said I did okay. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> this is Shelly Island, August 17, 2017. It's really just a sandbar. Everybody knows that. Anybody that lives here understands that things change quite a bit. That island was about 27 acres and nine-tenths of a mile long. This is from the end of January from this year. It's changed quite a bit since then. You can see that that sandbar is gone. It's merged with Cape Point. Uh, the campground up to the upper left there is the Cape Point campground. So things have changed. And since Winter Storm Riley came through, I'd say from going down to Cape Point on Friday, it looks like Cape Point's about half the size that it was just, just a week ago. So things changed quite a bit. Uh, we've talked a lot about offer vehicle management. I won't go into the details other than to say that over the last year uh, we had a record number of offer vehicle permits sold at just under 40,000 permits. Every year this seems to be a more and more popular activity at the mm -hmm. seashore. We've also had, through some changes that we've made, increased access in the areas that are open. There are 29 miles throughout the year open for driving at Cape Hatteras Seashore. In 2013 and 2014, we had between 17 and 20 of the 29 miles open. We started to make some changes in 2015 to enhance access and saw an immediate jump in the miles open on average between May and September. And over the last couple of years, we've come close to you know, really being able to open almost all of that mileage. Last year, 94% of the mileage was open between May and September. Uh, these are some of the improvements we've made locally. This is ramp four across from the Oregon Island Fishing Center. We raised that ramp by 24 inches to make it more uh, resilient to flooding, which has been an issue. Okay, I'm going to 
Maybe you can help me at the computer. This is a video I just wanted to show you in terms of some of the impacts we had just very recently. Let's see if you're able to play that. I lived in this house for three months. This was just just a week ago, and this is our housing in basically in South Nagshead. And we had that wash over there. It basically occurred for four days at every high tide. And uh, this is not unusual. This is a great snapshot of what a lot of folks endured. But unfortunately, that unit is probably going to be mostly uninhabitable, which will be a real impact for being able to house seasonal staff this summer. Uh, and we are most likely moving those two housing units. When we get the funding, they'll be moved as far across the street as, as we can. Oh, I love this photo as well. This is 1960. And the two housing units that are closest to the beach, the one on the left is the same unit that the waves were washing around. You can see in this photograph in 1960, folks that walked to the beach probably were, you know, breaking a serious sweat by the time they got there, and now they can dive off of their front porch. Uh, some other improvements at the Coquina Beach day use area. We put a new handicapped accessible boardwalk in that survived the storms very well. We're proud of these enhancements we've been able to make. This is one down on Hatteras Island. And uh, what to look forward to. This is the Wright Brothers Visitor Center. It's a national historic landmark. It was built in 1960 as part of what was called the Mission 66 uh, building era in the Park Service. So the Mission 66 era started in 55 and it ended in 66. Does anybody know why 1966 was an important date? It's a quiz. <laughs> okay, so last year, 2016, was the centennial of the National Park Service. So 66 was the 50-year anniversary. So over a billion dollars was poured into the Park Service, and this is a prime example of a Mission 66 Visitor Center. The Secretary of the Interior designated it as a National Historic Landmark in 2001. So we're making really good progress on the Visitor Center rehab, and I'll tell you, it's been challenging. Brand new roof, all new windows in the building. These windows stretch from this end of this building all the way to the other, other end. They're custom fabricated. So um, anybody that's done a kitchen renovation knows that something like this is a kitchen renovation on steroids. So we're hoping to have the visitor center redone late in August. It wouldn't surprise me if it's a delayed a little bit, but we will be sure to invite all of you and uh, all the residents of Kildelville Hills and Dare County to enjoy the ribbon cutting for the grand reopening. Some great partners, the Outer Banks Preservation Association uh, helped us with a pack it in, pack it out campaign. This is an effort to try to encourage and educate the public to take their trash off the beach with them. I will tell you we're having an increasingly difficult time with trash even right here on the highway, on landing, on Collington Avenue, with trash blowing out of people's vehicles. I don't know where it's coming from, but we are spending several hours every day just trying to work on this with NCDOT, and it's, uh, it's really more difficult than cutting the grass these days. So we would love to talk to all of you, and we've been speaking with our, our partners with NCDOT and Dare County about ways to do some better messaging here. The Beach Buggy Association and Cape Hatteras Anglers Club and Outer Banks Preservation Association helped us on a new ORV educational video. And I also want to thank the First Flight Society and the Outer Banks Tourism Bureau for supporting last year's National Aviation Day. So thank you so much for the opportunity to provide an update. Happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Dave. Any questions? How much does an off-road permit cost, and how long is it valid for? We sell two off-road vehicle permits. We sell a 10-day permit that costs $50. It's valid for 10 days. And then we sell an annual permit, and that's valid for 365 days from the date of purchase. It's $120. And you can buy those online. You can go to recreation.gov. You can buy one right now from the computer. You can print your own and tape it to your windshield. Any other questions? Dave, before you go, I would just like to thank you for the great work that you do. Um, just in, I know my interaction with you on a professional level, you're just responsive and approachable. And some of these great um, trends that we've seen over the past few years, I think, are very attributable to the, the, 
the way you lead and manage, and so I just want to thank you personally for that. So. Thank you, Mayor Davis. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Next, under introductions and presentations, is an opioid abuse presentation. And John, would you like to introduce your guest? Commissioner Winley has um, put this presentation together. So. Sure. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, Roxana Ballinger from the Health Department and from the Deer County Saving Lives Task Force. Thank you for coming out today. Thank you, Commissioner Winley. Um, Commissioner Winley, who is also a member of the Saving Lives Task Force, he uh, wanted me to come today to talk about what we're doing with the task force. And so um, I'm happy to come and uh, share all that information with you. And thank you for the, the invite. Very nice. Um, first, I want to talk about. Let's see. We got the pointer here. Okay. First, um, I'd like to talk about our history and how we got started, real quick. We had um, back in 2014. You know, we had resources in Dare County for substance use disorders. Of, many things addressing those kinds of things. We had Port, and we had Project Purple, and DARE CASA, and law enforcement. Um, but everybody was kind of working and, and doing their own thing. Everybody was working in a, a silo. Um, and Commissioner Wally Overman pulled everybody together um, back in July of 2014, and that's how we got started. We started initially as the Substance Abuse Prevention and Education Task Force. That's what we um, felt like the, the direction and the need were, and um, we quickly, um, wasn't too long after that, maybe about a year or so, we got settled in, and it took a while for the task force to really get going. At first, um, you know how it is, people don't show up and uh, that sort of thing, and um, it started to really take a grip with the community, and um, more and more people started to come, and, um, you know, Opioids and, and overdoses is in the news. It's in the news every day. You hear about it, um, and people want to come forward and do what they can to help our community. So we decided to change our name, um, and we changed it to the Saving Lives Task Force. We ended up broadening, broadening our whole mission to encompass all age groups. We started getting into treatment and recovery. Um, and it was more reflective of what we were doing and helping to get naloxone out there, you know. And um, so now we have over 70. This actually is out of date. There's probably more like 80 or 85 people who actually are on the task force. And you can see some of the names up there. And that certainly isn't all of them. We have um, faith communities, um, Walgreens. Um, John is on our task force now. He's gotten very involved in it. Um, the Outer Banks Hospital, um, so a lot of a lot of important people came to the table. Our mission, the Saving Lives Task Force, is a team of professionals and community members working toward the prevention of substance use disorders and increasing access and the availability of effective treatment for all of your county residents. Some of our accomplishments. The first year, we held a, a big community forum, um, and that was at Jeanette's Pier on September 10th, 2015. Uh, we had 160 people attend, which, you know, from Deer County standards, that, that was a lot of people. I mean, that, that place was really packed that night, so uh, we had good attendance. Our second one was focused on addiction and recovery, but that was held at First Flight High School. Then, at the end of those two years, we kind of regrouped, and... Um, you know, we wanted something that was more personable, where people felt comfortable coming forward and having an open discussion about their concerns. Um, so we went to a town hall model, and last year we had four town halls um, throughout the county, all related to the opioid crisis in one way or another. And in 2018, uh, we're doing the same model, town halls. Um, we held our first one on February 7th. Um, that one was focused on the syringe exchange program and there and why it's important. We, we, we do support the syringe exchange program. Source Church um, administers the program, but we provide them a lot of support and supplies so they can do that. We also installed two drug, two drug 
box, drop off boxes. One of them actually was put here um, at the Kill Devil Hills Police Department in November, and we put one in uh, February 2016 in Max Head. Um, some of the other things that we have done, we've promoted the drug drop-off boxes, um, sheriff's department picking up, they will come to your house and pick up your medications. Um, we've worked with Dare Casa to get naloxone in all the schools and all the um, health departments here. Um, we were the first ones, first health school system in North Carolina to get naloxone in the schools. We partner with Source Church. Um, we have held three provider education events. Um, you know, we talk about the community and other other happenings, but the, a, a big piece of it is the physician education um, and prescribing practices and educating these doctors. Um, you know, it took us a long time to, to get where we're at now. It's going to take us a while to turn that around. So the provider um, prescribing and um, medication-assisted treatment, we've held three of those. And we started a website, so that's kind of exciting. That's still in process, savinglivesobx.com. We've also started a, a Facebook page. Um, we started our newsletter almost a year ago. This is it right here. We put it out on a, on a quarterly basis. I have um, a stack of them back here, right back here on this table. Um, lots of good information in it. We do a different subject matter every quarter. And um, if you have any questions or you want more of these, we, I can get those for you. Some of our opportunities, we want to continue to build those protective factors with our kids. Um, we got to get the kids early, not later when they're <coughs> teenagers um, and they've gone down the wrong road. It's much harder to turn that back around. So um, Peer Power, we have that program in the schools. Life stories for kids, the, the kindergarten through um, grade two. We started that in September of this year. We're piloting that in two elementary schools. Rachel's Challenge, um, Triple P, which is um, Positive Parenting Program, um, Children Youth Partnership um, heads that off, um, and that helps parents be better parents to help their kids. And um, Children Youth Partnership, we're also working with them on the Outer Banks Resiliency Initiative, um, ACEs Awareness, which is Adverse Childhood, childhood Events. Um, there is going to be uh, more coming out about that. You'll hear more and more um, over the, the summer about that. And we're also working with the Detention Center. Um, you've probably seen a lot of that in the news also, too, in regards to, um, you know, 80% of the people that come into the jail system, they have mental health and substance use issues. So we're working with the detention center to get skillful programs for the inmates in there. Um, instead of them sitting around and wasting time, um, helping them get some skills that they need that's going to help them when they get out. EMS, um, we started a partnership with EMS um, to start a naloxone community distribution program. I'm not going to talk too much about that. Jenny will be coming up in a few minutes to talk more about that. Um, another initiative that we're working on now is getting naloxone into the gap areas. You know, we have naloxone, all of law enforcement has naloxone, the sheriff's department has it, so now we need to work on those areas in the community that need naloxone that don't have it, and they don't have the revenue source. Um, for instance, the volunteer fire departments, um, Jenny and her team um, spent the last six months training all of them and getting them um, to carry naloxone, those first responders. And um, diversion, um, pill disposal bags, you know, so we don't throw those pills in the, the trash or flush them down the toilet. Um, and we'll be working with the area pharmacies to hopefully, or they can start giving those away when a prescription is written for an opioid, along comes a pill disposal bag with that. Our meetings are open to the public. They're the third Tuesday of every month at 3, 3 o'clock in the admin building. Anyone is welcome to come. We welcome you to come, and, um, you know, we would like for everyone and all the towns to 
to be a part of the solution and um, to be there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And next, um, Jenny Collins, Chief Jenny Collins of EMS. She's going <coughs> to come up next and talk more about Naloxone. Thanks. Welcome, Thank Jenny. You. Thank you very much for allowing me to come and, and talk with you this evening about this. It takes um, a widespread community effort to address the issue of the opioid um, epidemic that's not just here in Deer County, but throughout this nation. Um, as Roxana had talked about, um, all the various initiatives that are going on, I want to highlight a couple with the EMS department that um, we've been doing. Um, naloxone is not new in EMS. It's been there decades and decades and decades. Um, and we administer it IV um, so that if we're on the scene when we start an IV, um, that is one of the medications that we do give via IV and we titrate it or give amounts based on the, the patient's condition because we have much more control over the medication that way. We also use it not just for opioid overdoses. There's sometimes you're on the scene, you know exactly what's happening. Um, but if you find an unconscious patient and you have no information about them um, and there's no um, things that are around them that clue you in um, that this might be an overdose, um, it is part of what we call a differential diagnosis. So we could have a cardiac arrest or an unconscious um, you know, person and we're not sure what it is. There are several things that we check. Naloxone is just one of those uses during that differential diagnosis that we can do. So when I give you some statistics, keep in mind these are not just overdose um, situations because it's a wider variety um, in our field that we use it for. However, but the, the naloxone um, being available to all first responders is a proven effective strategy to be able um, to have these opioid overdose patients um, survive the incident. You can't get somebody into treatment if they don't survive. And sometimes it takes numerous attempts and numerous times of working with these patients to get them to the point where they realize they need to reach out and help. Um, and that's where some of the um, fatigue that you see in the media about these particular issues comes from is just, you know, why do we keep doing this? Um, well, you're doing it because you need patients to survive to be able to get into treatment programs. Um, and the next speaker is going to talk a little bit about that. The issue is the sustainability of having naloxone available to all first responders. Um, you know, thank goodness that the Saving Lives Task Force has, you know, received some donations and been able to purchase it. Um, our next speaker, Donnie Burnell, with the Sheriff's Office is going to talk about the Harm Reduction Coalition and how um, naloxone became available for law enforcement agencies initially. But through the donations with the Saving Life Task Force, we were able to purchase some naloxone that we could outfit in all the fire departments across the county, including Kill Devil Hills. Um, EMS went out, did the training for them, um, and pro provided the kits, but we only had enough in that initial batch to outfit them with one kit. Um, and the replacement um, of that kit, um, hopefully through additional donations, we'll be able to look at and have a process to do that. But again, it's based on the sustainability of those donations and through grant programs, and we all know that those don't last in forever. With EMS, we budget and um, purchase our naloxone just as with all of our other medications that we provide for patients. Um, we're now moving into through um, Harm Reduction Coalition through an initiative with the North Carolina Office of EMS that um, just last week I was delivered um, naloxone kits that we're going to be able to provide when we are at an at-risk household um, and the patient's not going in for further treatment. Because if we get there and the patient is unconscious or in cardiac or respiratory arrest, most of the time in respiratory arrest and we're able to revive them, 
and they come back to full consciousness, they um, and, and they know where they're at, they can make a decision whether or not they're going to be transported for treatment. We can't take anybody against their will. Um, and in those types of situations, we will be able to leave an naloxone kit with that patient, with their family, um, because we recognize they're at risk to have this happen again, with information on the various programs that are available within the county, whether it's needle exchange, syringe exchange, counseling, um, you know, where they can go to get some help with their addiction. In last year, 2017, um, there were 52 patients that EMS um, was on the scene with, and we're on the scene with most of the ones that law enforcement or fire and rescue have um, administered naloxone. Um, out of those 52 patients, 20 of them occurred within the town of Kildoval Hills. So roughly 38% of the cases that we responded to or within Kilburn Hills. That doesn't mean the person lived here, it just means they had their incident here, their occurrence of that. Um, for law enforcement, because I have some statistics on that, when we get on the scene, a total of 50 milligrams of Narcan had been delivered, and then we administered another 70 milligrams of Narcan to those patients. So at times it takes multiple doses because of the amount of drug that they may have um, administered to themselves to keep them um, in that conscious state or in a, a state where they are able to breathe on their own and that we can further their treatment and transport. But again, remember, not all of those cases are opioid overdoses because it is given in that differential diagnosis um, situations. The important thing that I'd like to leave you with is talking about the sustainability of the naloxone, um, uh, you know, kits, both, um, you know, for law enforcement and for fire and rescue, um, because it's critically important that all those pieces of that puzzle come together, and that first first responder that is on the scene have that availability with them, and we certainly want and want to have that not available because it wasn't in somebody's budget or, you know, we ran out of grant money. So if there is something that the, the town is interested in doing it and working with Chief Tilly with Fire and Rescue um, or, you know, the Kill Double Hills Police Department and making sure that that stays sustainable, I would absolutely encourage that because many times the fire department or law enforcement happens to be on the scene before one of our medic units can get there and revive the patient. So next um, speaker I'd like to introduce is some um, special investigator with the Dare County um, Sheriff's Office, Donnie Brunel. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And uh, I was told to keep it short. Anybody who knows me, I'll do the very best I can. But uh, <laughs> I was told to talk about the drug trends in uh, Dare County in North Carolina. And I was going to start with the Opium Wars of 1658, but I figured the time restraints have been given, maybe I'll cut it down a little quicker. Uh, I will tell you that in Dare County, like very much in North Carolina and, and pretty on par with most of the nation, uh, law enforcement runs into marijuana more than anything else. Still, it's been that way for 40 years and it may keep being that way. There's a lot of substances in this world, however, and alcohol is one of them, but just counting illicit street substances and legitimate substances like pain medication that's used for illegitimate purposes, I'll stick to that. So we see marijuana a lot. It's usually small amounts. Occasionally we get larger. About three months ago, we have got six pounds from one person. So marijuana is still prevalent. It has been from the 60s, and it still is. Marijuana now is much different, however. Uh, people from the 60s, and I'm old enough to kind of remember some of the 60s. Uh, THC levels, or the active ingredient in marijuana, was about 3%. Uh, and you would hear people very often say smoking marijuana is like drinking a beer. Uh, and, and not to argue uh, legalities or making it legal or not legal, marijuana now is much different. It's been uh, upgraded. Uh, some of the fine students at some of our colleges have figured out a way to uh, make the THC, or the active ingredient, in marijuana up to 25 and 30 percent and if you cook it down in something called wax it's 70 percent THC which by weight 
is more effective than LSD. So you kind of start seeing marijuana has changed over the years and can be more serious. Uh, we have a real issue in Dare County where we have run into marijuana foodstuffs, cookies and candies and lollipops, which are, are retail sold, not the marijuana brownies you see on TV and in the, in the uh, movies and stuff, but like actually packaged. Uh, and the THC levels can be zero or 50%. You don't know what you're getting when you buy that kind of stuff. And we've had issues with young people with that in, in uh, Dare County. Uh, pain medication. That's kind of where this opioid issue started. That's where you see on TV, uh, we started to abuse pain medications uh, back in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, over 80% of all the hydrocodone sold in the world was sold in America. And 80% of everything sold in America was sold in Florida. And that was the epicenter of our opioid problem in, North, in America and now into North Carolina. Uh, so pain medication is still the biggest killer of drug overdoses in North Carolina. Pain medications, prescription opioids, still kill more people than any other drug in North Carolina. And we have about 1,300 drug overdoses every year. Uh, so we are still fighting the prescription drug issue uh, from the partnerships that we've done in law enforcement and regulatory agencies and uh, groups like Saving Life Task Force. Uh, we have done a better job on prescribing practices. That is changing. Uh, however, cutting back on prescription narcotics has also caused some of the problem we now see with heroin. Uh, I'm not saying better prescribing causes people to use heroin, but there are issues with people that started on prescription medications, uh, became, got a substance abuse issue, could no longer get prescription narcotics because they're very expensive. If anybody's ever had a pain pill or a pain medication from a doctor, if it was a five milligram hydrocodone, it costs five dollars on the street. So every milligram is a dollar. In Dare County, it's a little higher. I don't know if that's tourist prices or what because it comes across the bridge. <laughs> but it's a little higher. Heroin is much cheaper, and that's our new trend, heroin. That's what you hear about. That's what we were, we've been chasing for about four or five years. Uh, heroin was dumped on our street by the ton, by the drug cartels, very cheap. It was about $2 for a bag instead of, say, $30 for a 30 milligram hydrocodone pill, or I mean uh, oxycodone pill. So our trend became heroin, uh, and heroin overdoses have spiked over the last three years, well over 500% increase in heroin overdoses, which brings us to the final trend that we are dealing with all the time now, which is fentanyl. Uh, fentanyl used to be a drug only for chronic cancer patients, chronic pain patients. It was on a patch. Most of us remember the fentanyl patches. That's not the fentanyl we're dealing with. We were dealing with fentanyl that's being made in clandestine labs. Uh, the strength can be much higher than the patches. Fentanyl is routinely said to be 50 to 100 times stronger than morphine per weight. So you can see the, the propensity of overdose when you're using fentanyl. Fentanyl is being mixed with heroin, cocaine, which we still see in Dare County, uh, and some methamphetamine. Now with fentanyl, we tested, I do work with the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition also, which is a nonprofit organization and is much more uh, in tune with the user population or street population. Uh, and we tested everything we could test in uh, Wilmington for about a month period, meaning the syringes that are being used by the users, uh, the spoons or cookers you see on TV, how they pull the uh, substance up, and 80% of everything we tested had fentanyl in it. If it's that in Wilmington, it's probably that pretty much nationwide. So fentanyl is becoming the new, is and will be the new trend until another substance comes into play. Uh, and that's why you, groups like the Safe Lives Task Force is so important. Now I'll tell you, I guess to continue the trend of me being up here, naloxone. Three years ago, no law enforcement agency in North Carolina carried naloxone, not one. Today we're getting close to 300, which makes us number two in the nation for percentage of law enforcement officers that carry it. Uh, and that's purely because of the relationships between law enforcement, harm reduction, and local communities because we all decided it was more important to save somebody's life than it was to do anything else. Uh, so we've put about 10, we've had about 10,000 drug overdoses that have been reversed with naloxone that's been provided by the North Carolina Harm Reduction in the last three years. It's 10,000 second chances. And as you'll hear people say, now we're starting to use multiple kits or applicators per call. 
because the fentanyl is so strong, one kit by itself won't bring a person back. So the naloxone has really been a, a, a lifesaver, figuratively and practically. <coughs> Uh, and in the Dare County Sheriff's Office, we've had approximately 25 reversals in the last two and a half years from the Sheriff's Department deputies. So it's important to keep. Uh, I will tell you that no matter how daunting this problem seems, and it is daunting, and we are fighting it from every angle we can, North Carolina is routinely considered one of the top states in being progressive against the opioid abuse problem in the nation. We're routinely invited to come speak at every national conference. And I will tell you, in North Carolina, you're fortunate that in Dare County you have several of those experts live in your county to be such a small county per capita compared to Charlotte and Raleigh and Lake Forest and places. So you have people here that are on the edge of it and have been very progressive in trying to fight the problem. So I think with the, these kind of events, while it seems like I say the same thing over and over again, the more people that hear it, the more people that want to get involved and find a program they can get behind, and there's many, uh, will do a better job at helping individuals one at a time stay alive. Thank you. 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 Thank the town has been progressive over the years from getting us automated external defibrillators, which I've had to use on several occasions. And this is our Narcan spray that we carry. All the officers, including our animal control officers, have it in the car. Um, we're all trained um, to carry it. I've had to use it in the last six months on a young man. Uh, we were able to get him back, but uh, circumstances later, um, you know, they go back, right back down the same, same path. So, uh, getting into this, uh, Donnie came in and trained us, and, and like anything else, uh, when I started in law enforcement, we weren't trained in, in, in this stuff. And in our police academies today, I, I teach to medical block, and we cover this. We cover the Narcan, um, and you would think some of the officers, the last thing they want to do is go out here and, and somebody that's overdosed that we're going to respond to and, and be a little adverse on giving this. But believe it or not, all of our officers have been receptive to it because they have seen it. We respond there. That person is literally dead. They're, they're clinically dead, almost being biologically dead. And we administer this stuff. Within seconds, we see signs of life come back. And if you've been there and saved somebody's life, it, I can't describe the feeling. So our officers, our frontline officers that are there, we have to, we're dispatched. We have to get there before fire and EMS because the scene is unsafe. So that's our job. We're dispatched first by protocol. We get there, make sure that scene is safe. We call in EMS and fire. So we're there always first and foremost to get the drug. So seconds to minutes is what saved your life. So we are seeing it, unfortunately, here in Kelly Hills and all across the nation. But thank you to the town, the town manager, the police chief, the board of commissioners for being proactive way of getting the AEDs in the cars for sudden cardiac arrest and having the Narcan. But we are seeing it. We have them fill out forms, and I get them every month. And every time somebody uses it, I get an email, and I replenish that Narcan back to that officer's hand. So we'll be glad to answer any questions. We're passionate about it. We're here to save lives. We're first responders, and that's what we do. So thank you for being in the forefront of allowing us to have this, because it is saving lives. This drug is obviously saving lives. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Any questions or comments for any of the questions? Jenny? Any questions? A couple things. First off, uh, thank you to all presenters for coming out tonight. Very uh, powerful and informative uh, presentation by everybody. Um, I'd like to invite everybody here to uh, attend Saving Lives Task Force meetings. I went, I wasn't I heard about it, and I went because I was curious, and I, it floored me. I, I learned so much about the issues facing our community, and, and, and it, it's moving to see all the different voices of people, and hear all the different voices of people trying to really help. So I would highly encourage anyone to go. Every voice is appreciated, and, and I think it will be something people can, will enjoy. Uh, before we move on, I know the time constraint here, I, I want to ask, where does Kildova Hills Police Department or Fire Department get the naloxone from? Who supplies our first responders now? We got started through Dare Casa about two and a half years ago, <laughs> and Donnie came in and, and got us trained. 
got it into the, the training forward, and we've had it. And, and up to this date, we've been getting the doses through Derricasa Coalition against substance abuse. On the ground. So uh, I want to kind of make sure I'm correct on this. Right now, first responders, not just in Kildare, but all through Derrick County, lots of it's being obtained and distributed on a donation and grant basis. There really isn't a set aside funding for this. Now I guess we're kind of, so it's not a continual established budgeted item. Um, one thing I like, to, you know, I worry that, talk about fentanyl and, and heroin and other things, is the potential is there for one day, especially peak summer season, where demand could out, outpace supply. And we could potentially have first responders in Kudo Hills and beyond. I mean, I have lots of them when they need it. Uh, I've given this a lot of thought, especially since my time with the task force. And I want to just ask you know, all of our first responders in town, when it comes time for budgeting, let's put a list of little bit of money aside to purchase the Moxa if the case ever comes up where we run out a little short. You know, I want to make sure us as a board, uh, we do all we, we can to make sure that every first responder in Kildare Hills always has naloxone. Yes. I don't think you have to worry about that uh, as long as I'm here anyway, but we've got a proactive uh, police chief and the fire chief, the DMS is here. Uh, the only downsize of the naloxone and Narcan is that it does have an expiration date on it. Yeah. So we, currently I have about seven kits on hand now. Now, you know, being able to project when we're going to use these is say. just like the wind blowing. Uh, it seems like when the bad, and Donnie can tell you, when the bad batch of drugs hit the streets, it all goes weeks and we don't have to use it, thank the Lord. And then we come in and, and one day I'm using two doses. Two days ago by, I'm using another dose. So uh, we keep it up. Uh, we, we have the money, that the Chief and I are going to make sure yeah. that it's there. Uh, but I can't put 10, 15 doses on the no, shelf, we have to and then it goes out, because I've got some right now on the shelf that's been out. What I'm bringing you here are these that expired about six months to a year. So um, there is a, a life expectancy in the shelf life on it, but um, rest assured, I'll be, we're going to keep it uh, in our hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But I also will say, and Chief Tilly can probably speak to this better, um, I think the fire departments do not have that budget holder. That medication had been uh, provided through Saving Lives Task Force um, and the sustainability of that. Um, you know, if we could guess that, I'd know the lottery numbers too. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, thank you all so much thank for coming out and presenting this evening. I'd just like to thank uh, Commissioner Winley for bringing this together. He's done an excellent job of putting it together and getting all the, the people here to enlighten us. And, and thank you very much, John. Okay. We will move on now then to item number three under presentations and welcome Dorothy Hester. Mm -hmm. She's the public information officer for Dare County. and. Good evening to y'all and, and thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I am here with Bobby Dobbs. He's behind me here. He's the channels manager for Current TV. Y'all may remember Current TV as GovEd TV. That's what we were known as for years. Um, but we appreciate a few minutes to let you know about the local programming. We've Since Bobby has been our manager for a little over four years, we've made some great improvements and we want to let everybody know about those and take advantage of the opportunities to, to watch the programming that's available there. It's not only on for Spectrum customers anymore, it's now available, our programming is available online, anyone, anywhere in the world with a computer. And I think that's greatly appreciated, particularly, well, there's a lot of folks here who don't subscribe to cable anymore, so they appreciate being able to go online, but also non-government property owners. I think it's real beneficial for them, and we've gotten some great feedback about the ability for them to do that. It's just um, last year that we began marketing the channel as Current TV. It's the, a new name, a new look. 
but we continue to strive to offer programming that's valuable to the people who live here and vacation here. Um, we have a governing committee. Mayor Davies serves as your representative. She's very engaged. She does a great job. She served as chairman. And um, I also want to mention Michael. He's your primary staff contact. And I would have to say that the town of Kill Devil Hills is one of the more engaged with um, what we're doing. So we really appreciate that because we're partners and it helps when everybody um, is participating. So I'll go ahead and introduce Bobby Dobbs. Like I said, he is the channel's manager. We have the government channel and the education channel, and he's managing those channels on a day-to-day -day basis, and he's going to bring you up to speed on where we are and what we're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Bobby. Thank you. It's good to be here. Appreciate the time you've given us to uh, talk a little bit about what we do, and hopefully we can encourage you to use it. Um, the service is uh, there for you to use. Um, first, I'm going to start with what is Current TV? Well, Current TV is a collaboration, um, and that collaboration is designed to provide quality informational programming through two channels, Current TV Government, Current TV Education. And these are our member entities that you see there. It includes Dare County, all of the incorporated towns, and uh, three educational entities, the Dare County Schools, and College of the Albemarle, and uh, Coastal Studies Institute. So all of these groups work together to provide programming that you see on current TV, on either the government or the education channel. We have two channels on charter spectrum. Uh, channel 191 is the government channel, and then channel 198 is the education channel. Uh, they operate 24-7, 365 days a year, unless the Charter Spectrum Service is down for some reason. Uh, we are providing programming there on those two channels. Each channel is streamed over the Internet, as Dorothy was saying, 24-7. Uh, it's an exact duplicate of what you see on the Charter Spectrum channels, uh, and it's accessible through our website, www.currenttv.org. We also, at that website, offer an extensive video-on-demand feature where you can go and look, search for uh, individual video segments that perhaps you saw when you were watching the channel, or perhaps you've heard about or seen and would like to go check out further, you can go to our video on demand uh, feature on our website and see that one single video or many videos if you choose to do that. We also have a Facebook page that we launched and we currently are somewhere near uh, a thousand uh, views of that, uh, or likes of that uh, Facebook page. We also have a current or a YouTube channel. Uh, we took the old two YouTube channels. There was one for government, one for education. We've discontinued those. They're still up, but uh, there's not been much, hasn't been any new material added to those. We combine those two channels into a current TV YouTube channel, which houses videos for both education and government. A little bit about how we are funded. I'll try to go through this pretty quickly because it does get kind of complicated, but each participating member pays $1,000 annually. The town of Kill Devil Hills contributes $1,000. What that does is it provides them and the other entities uh, access to provide content to the channels uh, and representation on the Government and Education Access Channels Committee. They get one representative. Uh, each participating member has access to a fully equipped studio, which is located in our offices in the Dare County Administration Building in Manio. Uh, local program development initiative grants that help provide programming for the channel uh, and support from current TV staff. Each governmental entity receives a quarterly distribution from the state of North Carolina. Uh, this is based on uh, cable and satellite subscribers in the state. 
if you subscribe to one of those services, a piece of that bill that you pay goes to the state of North Carolina as a tax or fee, um, and then uh, that money is collected by the state, and then for certified HEG channels, public education government channels, that money is redistributed back out to those entities. Uh, here in Dare County, we combine the money that comes to all of our entity members, and uh, that's the money that is used to budget for the operation of the two channels, and that's what I manage. Uh, that's just a technical explanation of the uh, of how this is how this distribution is figured. You're welcome to go to the NCDOR <coughs> website and read for yourself all about it. Uh, but basically, they they base it on the number of channels that are certified in the state, and then it, it's also reflective of some other factors. And then they get a percentage figured out, and that formula is what gets distributed back to the entity. Current TV maintains an office uh, in the administration building of Dare County in the Public Relations Office in Manio. Uh, there are two employees, me uh, is the, as the channel's manager and Skip Wallace, who is a producer that works with us. We are considered Dare County employees uh, and are housed in that building. But we essentially work for all of the entities that we service. Uh, got a brief video here. We may have to switch to the video in another window. I don't think I couldn't get it to play from the web from the uh, PowerPoint. Uh, not that one. Yeah, no. No, that's not it. Uh, maybe. It's all I got. Okay. It went away. Okay. Well we'll we'll just talk about the website. This is our home page on our website. If you kind of just scroll down that a little bit and you can see. We have the video on demand that you can get to. There's a current uh, there's a link to each of our web streams there, the live stream for government education. There's a link to our uh, schedules, both government and education, so you can see exactly what's on. A little blurb about us, and then you can see the latest things that we've uploaded to, uh, to the site. And a link to our Facebook page as well. Um, if you go back up to the top real quick, I'll just go through these headings at the top. Uh, you can also get to these on the, on the top of the page. Um, and for the on the video on demand section, there are videos that are categorized by entity or by topic. In other words, Killed Up, the town of Kill Devil Hills has a section that has all of their videos in it. So if you want to find out everything that the town of Kill Devil Hills is doing, you can go there and see videos about all those fascinating things that they're engaged in. Uh, Watch Live takes you to the web streams. Program schedules takes you to the program schedules, and then there's a way to contact. We also feature a video. This changes from, you know, week to uh, every now and then we'll change this out and focus on a particular interesting video from one of our entities. This happens to be the new recycling video that the town of Southern Shores has done. Uh, it's pretty entertaining, actually, and uh, you should go there and check it out sometime if you want to learn about that. Um, and I would just encourage you in closing to uh, go to our website, spend some time there, and uh, get to know what's there and see how, how you might be able to use it as uh, you go about your daily life, living as a citizen here in Dare County. We also uh, do cover all of the meetings. Uh, all the entities bring their meetings to us, and we run those on the channel. They each air uh, four times. Um, and uh, we set aside time for that. Um, this meeting will likely be on probably Sunday, I would think. Um, so uh, that's another way to, get, to keep in touch, and you can also kind of peek in on how the other towns are doing uh, with their meetings. It's pretty interesting sometimes. That's all I have. If you've got any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them for you. Thank you so much, Bobby. Any questions for Bobby or Dorothy? Thank you so much. No, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for coming out and sharing this Appreciate space. it. Good information. Okay. Next, I'd like to welcome Ryan Henderson, the Executive Director of the Outer Banks YMCA, uh, to do a report on our partnership. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a, uh, it's a pleas
just want to give a, a brief update what we've been able to accomplish over the past year and highlight some of the program activities that, that we are able to do at, at the YMCA. Clicker here. Uh, but before we get going, oh, sorry. Uh, before we get going, I just want to give a brief update. Uh, I know many of you, but I don't know all of you, so I'll, I'll just kind of fill you in on, on my history. Uh, I grew up in Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, come from a family of seven boys. I am next to the youngest and uh, grew up with a love of basketball. And as, as evidence from my pictures here, uh, this uh, picture right here is my son in my sixth grade basketball uniform. Amazing that he that I, that I kept it, that I didn't lose it, and he still fit in it, so it was perfect. But uh, I moved to Outer Banks in 2004 after I graduated from college. My wife, uh, we met in college, got married. She was from the area here, so when she presented the plan to move to the beach, it was hard to turn down. And so we ended up here, and I, I worked in the mortgage industry until 2008, uh, and then became a stay-at-home dad uh, for a few years. Got into coaching, got into teaching, and just really fell in love with that, that aspect of, of a career path for me. So I started at the YMCA in 2011 as a camp director. I came in two weeks before camp started and uh, had, had a great summer. Uh, from that point, I took on a position as a youth and family programs director where I oversaw youth sports. And uh, youth sports was probably one of my favorite things to do there, youth soccer. Uh, if you want to have some fun, come out on a Saturday morning and try and chase around, chase around uh, 40, 3- and 4-year-olds after soccer ball. It is a uh, great exercise and a lot of fun. But uh, from that position, I have uh, moved into a role as our membership director. Uh, and then a year and a half ago, I took over as our director of operations and currently the executive director. So if there is a job at the Outer Banks YMCA, I have just about done it, uh, including cleaning toilets. Uh, I have not taught an exercise class uh, because I wouldn't be very good at that. But I love what I do. Very passionate about the work that we do here at the YMCA. Some of the highlights that I just want to touch on briefly from, from last year uh, what you'll see on the bottom and on the top left of the screen here is a swim team uh, that we began at, at, at the uh, beginning of two, end of 2016, beginning of 2017. We identified a need for some recreational swimming. Uh, we had a competitive swim team in the area, uh, but there was a gap for those kids who, who weren't really sure they loved swimming yet, but were interested in it. So we started our team with 30 kids, and uh, and to that, and then I almost gave away my clue. And we've been able to grow. What you see here on the bottom is the first meet that the Outer Banks YMCA has hosted for the swim team. We had four teams come in from out of the area, and it was it was a wonderful sight. A lot of energy felt in the building when swimming is going on. Uh, the top middle is a program that we do every every quarter, three times a year. Um, so it's uh, January, April, and September during our membership campaigns. We also offer a Battle of the Schools program, so the the uh, members are able to earn tickets for their for their workouts, for joining, for referring people, and they drop them into the schools of their choice. Uh, this program has been going on for about three years, and uh, for the first three years, Nags at Elementary School won every single one of our contests. And maybe just because they're right across the street. Um, so uh, we do a $300 donation to the school that wins. This year we switched it up, uh, so we're going to spread the wealth a little bit. So in January we highlighted a middle school, and First Flight Middle School won. In April, we'll highlight a high school, and then in September, we'll do an elementary school. So it's just one of the ways that we're able to give back and support the education in our community. Various partnerships that we've been able to have. Uh, we have a great partnership with the town of Kittleba Hills who has supported us, and we're very thankful for that. We're able to collaborate with many community uh, partners in the area. Uh, the Special Olympics, we host their swim team. They practice twice a week. We host their swim meet. They had their very first swim meet uh, two Sundays ago. Uh, where they had teams come in from out of the area on a Sunday morning. It was just it was wonderful. Uh, Children and Youth Partnership, partnership we, we host the Triple P Positive Parenting Program at the YMCA. Uh, foster care, we've done foster, uh, foster parents training. Uh, Sylvan hosts, uh, we host Sylvan in our facility. Friends of Youth comes in and uses facility for, for their youth. And then we also, um, Sporting Events, who are up next, have a, uh, we have a great partnership with them, and we're thankful for them. I do want to highlight uh, Special Olympics here. So this is a very, very uh, special program that we have going on. The top uh, picture is from three years ago, and uh, the bottom two pictures are from the swim meet that I just referenced uh, from two weeks ago. So it was, it was a great opportunity for our athletes who, who are practicing every twice a week uh, to come and, and be able to highlight their skills and what, what they're able to do. 
So my presentation now turns into more of an interactive presentation. Uh, so I'm going to ask for feedback from you guys. So this is a, here's a question for you. So in 2017, how many children attended our summer camp program? And I'm, there's no wrong answer. Well, there is wrong answers, but uh, just get as close as you can. And uh, I'll open it up to everybody. If you have a guess, we offer 11 weeks of summer camp. This is uh, non-duplicated. So I get to tell you, we have... We probably had a thousand sessions of summer camps that, that kids participated in last year. Um, any guesses on how many kids came? Twenty six hundred. Six fifty. Six fifty. Anybody else? So the answer is one hundred seventy one. <laughs> no, but no, your, your questions are right when you think about these. One hundred seventy one came to eleven. If they came eleven times, it's twelve hundred kids that, that, that came. 44% of the kids that came to our summer camp are from Kildo Hills. So it's by far the highest percentage that we had. Next question up is how many kids participated in a youth sports program for us last year? We offer four sessions of youth sports. Uh, little kickers we do twice a year because it's so much fun. Little dribblers is basketball, and then we offer a t-ball. This is mainly three- and four-year-olds. Meredith can't answer because she knows all the, she knows all the answers. She's been <laughs> Any, any guesses? 250. 250. It's pretty close. 154. 154. And again, it's, it's three and four-year-olds is what we focus on. Parks and Rec does a great job with the older kids, and, and, and we let them have that. So we focus on, on Pee Wee Sports. Again, 41% from Kildova Hills. Swim lessons. Swim lessons that we taught in 2017. 87. 87. Good guess. What up? Anybody else? Thought I heard something. 300. 300. That was close. 275. 275. And here's the thing about swim lessons last year. We only offered swim lessons through June. We have our aquatics director leave, and so for, that's only the first six months of the year. So 275 kids we were able to teach how to swim and improve their ability and keep them safe in the water. Again, 39% from Kidalba Hills. All right, this was just in here for fun. The only mammal that cannot jump. <laughs> Is an elephant. Right? Who would have known? <laughs> All right, and then uh, the swim team we discussed about. So, how many children swam on our swim team in 2017? He's going for it. 87. 87? Is that what you said? 82. No, I'm sorry. Wow. Close. Wow. Nice job. So we, we have done no, the only advertising we've done for our swim team is within the center. We haven't sent anything out to the schools. We started off with 30 kids. We're up to right around 60 kids right now. Many of them swim every month. And this is just a, a wonderful thing that we've been, been able to do. We've expanded to include a competitive side as well. So we also do U.S. swimming. We have a swimmer who qualified for the championships meets, who is a junior at First Flight, and will be attending those in Williamsburg uh, next weekend. How many members belong to the Outer Banks Family YMCA? 3,700. 3,700. That's a good guess. Yeah. 4,500? You work for us, so that's uh, <laughs> 50, 5,700. 50, look at this number, 46% from Kill Double Hills. And that's pretty significant. Uh, so, good job. All right, financial support that was given in 2017 from the Outer Banks Family YMCA to the <coughs> Outer Banks community. So for those of you who don't know, we offer an open doors program. So if you can't afford your membership and come in and tell us that, we will base our, your, uh, your membership on a sliding scale on the revenue that you make, uh, your taxable gross income. So very proud of the program. And uh, any guesses on the number here? 441,000. Right, that, that is significant. If you want to be a member at the Y, we'll take you. Right. No matter, what, no matter in what other place, well, there are many places, but I'm very proud of the fact that you can come in the door and we want you to be there. Um, the, the banner that you see here, if you go down the hallway of, of the uh, YMCA, there are banners that hang there for pe for uh, organizations and people who donate at a level of $1,000 or more. This is my banner here, not to, not to brag, uh, but to show you that I care about what we do. Our staff raises over $6,000 from their own paychecks every year support our Open Doors program, uh, which is which is pretty phenomenal. People work at the YMCA not for the money, 
but because they love and for them to be able to, to would be willing to give back is, is just just great. And then I have a quick video that I just want to share with you guys. If you click on that, it'll take you to the link. Cross my fingers here. What's your name? Glenn Williams. Glenn Williams? Yep. Glenn, do you remember when you first joined the Y? This is 1980. Oh, really? Yep. Okay. What brought you to the Y? Yeah. What was it? Yeah. So Glenn's relationship with the YNCA started back in 2003 when he was a member of the Adult Developmental Activity Program. And they, what they did was it was a partnership with the YMCA. Uh, they had a group of individuals with uh, mental or developmental delays or disabilities that would come into the YM YMCA and use it. In 2009, the, unfortunately, the Albemarle Mental Health Commission went away. And so the Adult Developmental Activity Program also went away. And it was at that time that, that Glenn actually became, went on his own and became an Open Door member here of, of the YMCA. Were it not for the Open Doors program that we have at the YMCA, there's no way that Glenn could have a membership here with us. Being on a, on a fixed income, um, if, if we did not offer some sort of assistance for Glenn, he, he'd be stuck in his house all day. Glenn's routine is the same every day, so he checks in at our front desk, asks him to play racquetball. When they say no, he pops over to my office and asks me if I'm available at that time. If I'm not available, then he'll go into the locker room, get changed, go into the hot tub, which he calls swimming. After uh, swimming in the hot tub, he goes into the workout room where he does two exercises. He gets on the bike to ride for a little bit, and then he pumps his biceps, because that's what he likes to do. He logs his active tracks, then we'll, we'll either play after that, or, or he'll come in and chat with me for a little bit before he gets picked up. This is a great working ball. One day he just happened to stop by and asked me to uh, if I wanted to play racquetball with him. And I thought, sure, sure, I'll play racquetball with you. We get in the racquetball court and I had played before and I asked Glenn, do you know how to play? And he said yes. And so, okay, explain to me how we play. And so he said, well, we'll start playing and if you can get the ball past me, you get three points. And I thought, that's great, that should be easy enough. And he said, if I can get hit by the ball, I get two points. And uh, so we started our, our game. But what I've come to realize, though, is that as I take the time on a daily basis to spend with Glenn, uh, it, it makes a difference in my day and in my life. The why changes lives. As much as we give to them, we get back in, in the same amount of love and development. In, in a world where Glenn may get lost in the transition or he may not stand out, uh, the why makes him feel important. Everybody loves him. Everybody says hi to him. Sorry. Why? See, it me happy. The friend, the wife, the happy to hear. So we have, we have a great facility, we have great programming, uh, but the true magic that happens at the YMCA happens in those everyday stories where people come in. Uh, it, it starts with our coffee club for uh, older adults who, who come in and drink coffee together and enjoy the time. It, it starts with Glenn who comes in, who gets out of his house and comes and plays racquetball. And uh, truly, Glenn believes he's the boss now. He tells, tells my staff he can't go home. <laughs> And when he wears his tie, he means serious, you know, serious business. <laughs> but I'm um, just grateful to, to be, a, be a part of that. So just a, a quick recap uh, of what we discussed today is um, our membership. Uh, the number that's not up here, and, and this, this KDH number that I want to share with you, uh, the percentage of members uh, that are on open doors at the YMCA is, is 36, 36%. So when you come in, one out of every three people are receiving some sort of assistance to be there which is a huge number and a huge need in our area, and we're just grateful to be a part of it. And I uh, love what I do. I'm passionate about what I do. If I can do anything for, for anybody who's here, more more than willing to, to do that. So thank you for your time, and I'll open up the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Ryan, I have to tell you, you know, you started off by saying you um, have a love for basketball. So just a quick, quick story. Last night, um, Wyatt went and watched. You were on the team. Um, there's a, 
I forgot what it was called. It was a basketball Slam game. for school. But that was yeah, it. So it was for um, the Dare Education Foundation. He was so excited. The first thing he said when he walked in the house last night was, did you know that Ryan can dunk? <laughs> he was so excited about that. So All kept secret. He was very impressed. Very impressed. Yeah, I think it was a lot of fun. So, thank you. Great thank you. presentation. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks. All right. Um, our last but not least presentation, um, welcome Ray Robinson and Jenny Ash with the Outer Bank Sporting Events. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you all so much for having us. Uh, Jenny's actually been nice enough to let me start out because I've had laryngitis all this week, so we'll see how long I can last. Um, as you guys know, Outer Bank Sporting Events has been around uh, more than a decade and uh, been a light in the community in ways of economic development as well as uh, donations to our two beneficiary foundations, uh, Air Education Foundation, which you just spoke about there, Slam Ducks, and Outer Banks Relief Foundation. Can I interrupt for one second? This is, Sheila, I have to tell you that this morning when I got to work, Ray popped into my office and said, did you know Ryan dunked last night? <laughs> <laughs> I did, I did. I was, very, I was very glad that he did because, and, and he'll, he'll be uh, modest and not say this, before the game I said, Ryan, you got to dunk on these guys. And, uh, and he did, so very, very good. Um, even afterwards, the guys were still talking about it when we took him out to dinner after. <laughs> so... Uh, some of you may or may not know about our mission. Our mission um, is four part, uh, to organize and promote sp uh, sports competitions. Um, also to do this around healthy living, uh, which obviously you guys know about our marathon and half marathon and other events. Um, and also to provide financial resources for the Relief Foundation and Dare Education <coughs> Foundation um, while contributing economic um, impact to the Outer Banks. One of the things that um, we announced this past year was our $50 million economic impact to the Outer Banks folks. That's accommodations, that's food on tables, that's keeping our folks uh, working during the shoulder season. Okay, now let, let's talk about how that breaks down, how do we get to that number. So last year we had just over 7,500 runners uh, come to uh, our events. That was a 5% increase over 2016 in our full marathon amount. Um, those folks brought about 3.2 people with them. So that gave us uh, 24,000 um, total participants that came out. Um, in addition, most of those folks were females, 55% female, 45% male. Um, and our average age range is about 35 to 45, uh, which is, is, is great. Um, and we have everyone from a one-year-old doing our fun run so I think last year at Flying Pirate, we had an 85-year-old woman uh, finish our 5K, and she did not finish last. Um, so uh, she's pretty remarkable. Um, visitors, um, as you can see, 23% um, of the folks who come are first-time visitors to the Outer Banks. So where are these folks coming from? Well, you see each one of our races down at the bottom, and you see uh, 47 uh, states represented Flying Pirate. Uh, 28 states represented Storm the Beach, 29 at our triathlon, and 47 at the marathon. Uh, we have folks from all 50 states, and this year, 18 countries. Uh, last year, we were at 12. Uh, Jenny pulled the, the numbers and the demographics, and I said, oh, man, we, I, I didn't see Norway, and I didn't see some of these other ones. So uh, very, very happy to say that we, we have an international presence. Um, as the Outer Banks, and we couldn't do that without, K without KDH. Okay, so our races encourage healthy lifestyles, and I'll let Jenny kind of speak to some of this. First of all, thank you, Mayor Davies and Board of Commissioners, for having us. We always like coming and not only hearing the other presentations, but realizing the partnerships. Before I start on this, I just wanted to say as I sat through the other three or four folks that stood up, I realized that we have some sort of connection with everyone. I mean, not only your town staff, you guys are sort of the hub or the midsection of both of our point-to-point -point runs, which is, um, you know, always sort of the point to get to is to encircle the monument and you feel like you're halfway there and um, your staff is a pleasure to work with and permitting and everything like that, as well as, you know, the YMCA, the National Park Service, um, and Jenny Collins and her EMS staff. So as I sat here today, up until this point, I realized how many tie-ins there are 
when we do come out and discuss all the things that we all do. So thanks again for helping facilitate all that throughout the year. Um, so the registrants, uh, we do have, like Ray mentioned, the uh, presence of, you know, all over the country and out of the country that make, make up our, um, our uh, participant base. And that is, speaks volumes to what we have to offer here as a community that a lot of people like to make it a destination race and plan around um, an active vacation. And locally, the Outer Banks Hospital sponsors a Couch to 5K. I think that's changing up a little bit, but reflective of 2017, we had a lot of folks. Um, Assistant Chief Harris uh, was had his bib number right on his uniform, and he was, I have a great picture of you. I should frame that for you, because that was a great representation of community involvement. and. Uh, tag team and keeping an eye on everybody and participating yourself, so that was fantastic. And I didn't finish last year. <laughs> right, you did not finish last year. You had a good, uh, good spring in your step, I do remember that, so good representing. Um, is this, did you do this? Sure, I can, oh, I can I, speak to it. Well, I didn't know if you had already done it. No, no, I can speak to it. So as, as we were talking about the $50 million impact, the question is, okay, how much of that money is going back to our um, uh, beneficiary uh, charities and things of that nature. So in 2017, we were able to give more than $50,000 to each one of our two beneficiary organizations, and that brings us to a total generated since 2010 of more than a million dollars to each charity. Uh, that's that's major, and it's only because of you guys that we've been able to do this. Um, let's talk about some of the impact of that. So Dare Education Foundation, as you guys know, uh, has worked hard to do teacher housing, as well as grants to uh, school groups and uh, things of that nature. I think a huge proponent of the Avid program and some others. Um, Relief Foundation, uh, I, I have to tell you this story. I've only been here a year, as most of you know, and I got a chance to go down to a florist down in, in, in Mania. And uh, it was before an event that was going on, and I was helping out, and she started to tell me a story about her husband passing away. And the Relief Foundation was able to help her out. And many of our stories were not able to tell, but she told me, please share my story when you go out and talk. Um, husband passed away. The Relief Foundation was able to help out with several thousand dollars to help her and, and her children uh, get back on uh, their feet. And uh, she worked and has started her own florist shop. Um, I'm very, very proud of that, uh, that story. I'm very proud of, of that lineage uh, for her and her family. Uh, those are the things that you guys helping us out and coming out and running with us and volunteering and, and working uh, allows to, to happen in our community. Um, we're very, very proud of it. Okay, here, here's the huge number and the most important number um, here as we talk about um, KDH. $1.5 million in economic impact this year in KDH. Um, that's a little over a thousand participants who stayed here um, when they visited the Outer Banks. They brought 3.2 guests with them uh, for a total of uh, a little over 4,600 visitors. And we work out the per diem at $75 per day. And the average person stays about 2.7 days, uh, which gives us a per diem of 950000 um, and accommodations of over $600,000. So to date estimated for the 2017 season. $1.5 million uh, in KDH. Guys, that's 100% that's because of you guys. 100%. So what to look forward to? We have Run of the Leprechaun coming up this weekend, which is great. We had great attendance in the past. It's something that we inherited last year. Um, and you also see our other events here and schedule. Um, we will uh, continue to want to partner with you guys and um, bring folks here to KDH as well as talk about all the great um, attractions uh, just to see the, uh, the, the Wright Brothers Memorial and things of that nature has been great for our folks. Uh, I can't tell you enough how many folks come out for the first time and they look up and they go, this is, this is where flights started. Um, and of course we tell them that it, it is KDH, not, not Kitty Hawk. Uh, <laughs> certainly open up to any questions or um, concerns or comments. I did want to make a mention of a uh, 
fantastic uh, result of something that happened before I was race director and before Ray was here. Um, it's been five years now. Um, speaking of the monument, there was a gentleman that passed away at the start of our 5K. And it wasn't race related. It was before the race even started. It was just a terrible, you know, act of God. But um, his daughter called me about six months ago and said, our whole family's coming back to run the 5K this year. And we're going to put a, you know, in memory of on the bib. And it just seems like it came full circle to, you know, you always wonder how they're coping and how they're handling things. And they sent me um, a eulogy to pull from to make some announcements at the start and just really embracing coming back and looking at the positives that running and community events and all those types of things gave that gentleman before he passed. So just an update on that, because I'm sure you're all aware of, of when that happened. And, um, you know, just to have a positive spin on the ending of that is, is fantastic. But um, again, yes, I'm the race director. So I'm logistics, course stuff, volunteers, all that good stuff. And working for Ray has been fantastic. He's our executive director, like he said, as, as of about a year. So if you have questions for either of us, our emails are here and they're easy to remember, but I'll certainly answer anything now, too. Great. Jenny Ray, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? All right. Well, thanks again for the opportunity and uh, coming up on some good races. So I hope to see you out there. Great. Thank you so much. <coughs> okay. We will keep moving then on to um, new business, item number one, and welcome Ken Wilson and Julian Deese. Welcome, gentlemen, um, to, to a beach nourishment post-construction survey presentation. So welcome. Oh, I'm sorry. Jenny, did you have one more thing? I do. I'm, oh, I'm so sorry. sorry. No, I'm sorry. I didn't need to jump on. You, you were invited. I was a little bit uh, on, the, on the album. So I just wanted to present each year we have a local artist um, create a piece of artwork. And excuse the bags, but you know the weather when I was coming in. Um, so we would like to just present you with this year 2017's artwork for the marathon. And it's called Dauntless Resolution. And um, Ben Miller was the artist and he came up with this graphic that's you know different every year but nice color scheme and uh, wanted to present this for your wall and I noticed you've got a pretty good collection to add to so thanks for displaying and um, everything you guys do. Well, thank you, that's beautiful, that's thank great, you. nice addition. That's fine, thank you so much. Thank you. How's it going everyone? Uh, pleasure to be back. Uh, my name is Julian DeVies from uh, Aptum, and uh, Ken and I were up here uh, this summer for the Beach Nourishment Project, and uh, we did a post-construction survey in December, and just here to kind of talk about the results. Um, I'm sure you'll remember a lot of sand. Uh, it was enough to fill dump trucks from here to Key West and back, uh, so we'll just go ahead and take a look at, at where that sand uh, is moving. Uh, this was day two of construction in Kill Double Hills, uh, right at Helga Street. Uh, day 28, uh, Avalon Pier in the background, kind of coming together. We had three dredges working on the project. Um, and then what we, we'll kind of start to talk about what we see now. And something that we had shown a lot during construction, before construction, and all the meetings was this, uh, um, this uh, profile equilibration um, where we have a more of a rigid template that we build. And that Mother Earth, those Mother Earth, those uh, waves, just that sand redistribution. Um, we just talked about it a lot of the meetings. And with that survey data, we see a lot of that sand that is moving offshore and building those sandbars. So the examples we had shown were these pre-project conditions where you have your profile. Uh, then you go ahead and build your beach template. And then through that um, equilibration, you have some of that sand migrate offshore to build up those sandbars. And so you have your design, you have your erosion rates um, that you incorporate in your, into your design, and you're left with sand both on the beach and sand migrating and building those sandbars. Um, and so a couple photos of that process happening. Uh, this was a few months in um, after the completion of the Kill Devil Hills project, that same uh, area that we were looking at before, um, just uh, north of Avalon Pier. Um, this is south, uh, closer to Sea Ranch, uh, looking north here at Avalon Pier, but we see those, um, those 
that basically that sand that, which is basically moving offshore um, with those larger waves and those storms. So, um, and what we'll notice here, and I'll, I'll go back to this one, but here you see a lot of the waves breaking right on the beach. And as we progress, we see those waves moving farther and farther offshore, like we see in this photo, um, which again was something that uh, was taught. We just mentioned a lot of how that the sandbars are going to form, how what's that what that's doing to the wave action. Um, and this was uh, last month, and again, it's uh, you can see those waves you know, breaking offshore again. And this is Helga Street, uh, looking south. Uh, so in 2017 or December uh, 2017, we went ahead and conducted those post-construction surveys, uh, all four of the the beach, uh, Kill Level Hills, Kitty Hawk, Southern Shores, and Duck. Um, we swam out uh, profiles, and we also came in with a boat to overlap. Uh, so we have survey data every thousand feet um, throughout the beach areas. Uh, and so what we're looking at here is we take those surveys, uh, we plot them out to compare. Uh, we have our blue line, um, our pre-construction surveys, uh, what was there before the project. Uh, that green is what was constructed immediately after construction. Uh, so you'll notice again that the it's more of a, a rigid, flat berm, slope down, um, and then that this red line is the post-construction survey. And so again, this was built immediately after construction, and for reference, that black line is basically the water line. And so above the water line here, we see a lot more sand. Um, we see a, a wider beach. And what we see now is that sand, uh, similar to how those, those uh, sketches I'd shown earlier, we see that sand migrating offshore. And so there weren't any sandbars before here, and now we have this large block of sand immediately offshore. And again, that's why we're seeing those waves break so far uh, offshore, um, that accumulation of material. And this was, uh, uh, this is one of the profiles uh, between 4th and 5th Street, but looking at, and looking at all of them, they all look just like this with that, that sandbar accumulation. And, uh, the the post-construction report, um, the survey report will be finished in the next uh, couple of weeks, so uh, you could look through the rest of the profiles as well to see this. But um, And again, that reduction in wave energy. So those waves are breaking hundreds of feet farther offshore. That wave energy, by the time it hits the beach, has dissipated, and so you're getting less and less erosion um, due to those sandbars. And again, to, uh, First Street, exact same thing. Just wanted to show another example. Um, there was that green line again uh, was showing what was was built immediately after construction, and that red line. This is just the December conditions. And just again, important to remember, you know, anything above that black line, you know, you're going to see walking out on the beach, but anything below, you're not. And so, uh, just important to remember that you know that sand is migrating. Um, and then as we have our, our summer months come back, a lot of that sand comes back as well farther up the shore. But when you have you know, the winter months and the large storms, uh, that beach is protecting itself. So it builds that sandbar so that those waves do break. And then as the conditions, um, you get smaller waves in the summer, a lot of that sand migrates back up onto the beach. So uh, Another kind of interesting um, thing that we noticed uh, specifically during the construction of Kitty Hawk um, so these, we had those three storms, um, Irma, Jose, and Maria, um, in September. Uh, Kill Devil Hills was completed, uh, Kitty Hawk was still going on, and what we saw, um, Kitty Hawk anyway, some of the fan sand fencing that had been constructed, um, which is similar to what we saw in Kill Devil Hills over the last couple um, storms, which is completely covered um, after those hurricanes. And, just a reminder of how much sand uh, get moved, gets moved around with those large storms. Um, and again, um, the importance of that, and I'll scroll back to um, this, uh, this green arrow here, but just, just seeing that the actual berm we built at plus six, and uh, now it's several feet higher. And that's why you see that sand fencing um, getting covered. And we also noticed it here in Kill Devil Hills with these latest storms as well. So. Um, again, the, the, the dry beach portion um, is narrower, but it's also higher in elevation, and we also have a, that sand moving offshore and building those sandbars like we had talked about before and during the project. Um, and the last thing, just the, the bar areas um, as well. So this is uh, the bar area A that was uh, used for this project. Uh, these are you know, red areas or highest elevation or most sand. 
this is the same bar area, um, post construction survey, so you kind of kind of see where a lot of the sand was taken, and um, and this was the difference plot. Um, so blue areas again, most sand taken. So a lot of the bar area not used. Um, you know, really staying within a, a, a cut or two there, um, but just something interesting to, to take a look at. So. Um, yeah, just uh, th there's an established beach maintenance plan, um, and so moving forward, uh, just important to continue um, with that management, the annual monitoring um, surveys uh, conducted in the spring, so we'll be able to compare uh, those from year to year, uh, take a look at volume changes, uh, shoreline changes, uh, see where that sand is migrating. Also, renourishment intervals uh, right now is estimated at about five years. So we'll be able to, to update those and take a look at those. Um, and then just continue to track volumes. Uh, sand, um, like I mentioned, uh, moves offshore, builds those sandbars. But it also it can also go offshore and come back um, to what's called the depth of closure. And so as long as it stays within this envelope of down to 24 feet, it always has the chance of coming back onto the beach. Um, and so again, those sandbars that I had mentioned, you know, migrate back up, they migrate offshore. Um, and so just tracking those volumes above that, that um, depth of closure. Um, and then sand fencing, planting, uh, continue to monitor, continue um, to install as needed. Um, you know, we have the, the spring, summer coming up for planting. Um, and uh, yeah, just continue to monitor that, so. Any questions? How is it? Uh, is it better for surfers now, or it should be <laughs> with those waves breaking out there? It should be. I kind of thought so. Kind of good last that. week. Yeah, it did. We saw some uh, pretty cool pictures of uh, waves and guys getting out there and uh, stuff I would never attempt. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, our guys at the office down in Wilmington were pretty jealous last yeah. week. <laughs> yeah, it looked pretty good there. Didn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Julian, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Andy, I mean, I know just heard such great things about the whole pro project and the progress and the contractors, and um, it really, really, really went well. So no, that's pleased. great. And, yeah, that's really great to hear. And it's um, yeah, obviously, you know, those sandbars building and everything. I mean, it's great to see that protection, you know, out there. And the survey is just showing where that that sand is moving to. So. Yeah, and as it was going on, you guys' uh, response to the oceanfront owners that had any concerns and you addressed them directly and mm -hmm. took good care of that. And I was really impressed when I went out to the dredge. <laughs> yeah. I really want to highlight Those ships are, yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Pretty amazing. amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for Well, that. thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. So in the packet, um, it was also described in the memo, was about um, basically the monitoring proposal, which... Um, oh, it's described as the 19 profiles, a survey report, a one-year post-construction report, um, which Julian was uh, mentioning. So I believe we need a motion to um, adopt this proposal for monitoring. Yes, so. ma'am. So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please signal saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, it's been a long time since we first started about yes, sir, it has. <laughs> Many decades, actually. It's good yeah. to see it. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, Thanks, Ken. Okay, next under new business is item number two. This is the wind turbine report. And um, before I turn over to Debbie, I'd like to recognize, oh, or I was going to recognize you, and I didn't realize you were, anyway, I was going to recognize former Commissioner Michael Midget. Thank you for being here. And I was simply going to turn it over to you. Well, that's perfect, because <laughs> well, you started great. this, so it's yes. great, and, and only appropriate that you're going to be sharing with us, so welcome and thank you. Right, thanks for having me. So in the interest of time, I'll, you know, I'll go through this report pretty quickly for you. So back in December 2017, the Board of Commissioners had a meeting and the staff was authorized to explore the possibility of constructing a wind turbine energy generating system at one of the town's facilities. The concept of the wind turbine includes installation of an educational kiosk at the site to provide information on energy generated and savings to the town. And of course, any energy that we produce and what's sold to Dominion. So the success of this potential project will depend on several things. The size of the turbine needed to meet the goal of the project, 
the height of the turbine to reach the winds necessary to generate the energy and the consistency of the winds and the location of the turbine and the educational kiosk. Discussions between Mr. O'Brien and the officials at the Appalachian State University, which was instrumental in making the wind turbine at the First Flight Middle School a reality, indicate a need for hard wind speed data. Hard wind speed data is derived directly from an anemometer is more accurate than the wind speed maps and specifically applicable for the area in question. There's more information available from the middle school <coughs> turbine but will only be good as a baseline. So we want to make sure we get the, uh, the winds that we have here and we from, that, from there we'll be able to find a wind turbine that is better, better suited for our area and our winds. And with that in mind, the in monitor is installed at the first five middle school and it'll start capturing the wind speed data for our area. And the data will, let's see here. So the data is gonna be recorded over a one year period. Okay, and from, from there we'll be able, be able to understand the amount of energy that will be generated and we'll be able to, to determine the investment of our return. When that is complete, the final calculations will be completed to determine the feasibility of the town's project and the recommendations submitted to the Board of Commissioners. So we will report any information that we receive and how to proceed. So conceivably, it will be next year before we will have an idea of what we want to do. So it's probably better to go slow and be sure than to just, you know, throw something up because we want this to be a success. Questions for Michael? <coughs> Thank you very much for your work. Appreciate yeah. you bringing it to us. No Thank problem. You. Yeah, I appreciate you staying engaged and following that. And that's great that we're going to actually have some real data to, to use. Yeah. So I think that's, you know, waiting a year, but to have solid, <coughs> quantifiable figures is what we need. Yeah, and I, and I really didn't know that, you know, different winds require different turbines. So that was, you know, learning for me as well. I'll put forward to it happening and get it up there. And so has it been installed at the school yet, or they, are, they have agreed? And, oh, it already has. Yeah. That is it okay. has. So it's Good. recording, hopefully, all these paths. Lots of wind right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Two weeks back to that. Yeah, it's awesome. right? Okay. Well, again, thank you for staying with us, and then yeah. I guess you'll let us know when you're ready to present yeah. some figures back. Certainly will. Thank you, sir. Awesome. Right. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> Okay, we'll move then on to new business item number three, street improvement recommendation for fiscal year 1819. He's here. Welcome, Pete. It's better that you don't have the long drive back to Virginia after this, right? <laughs> I hope you don't anyway. You're staying local. Good. Thank you, Mayor, Commissioners, and staff. Pete Burkheimer. American engineering serving as town engineer and <clears throat> I guess one way to look at the last hour or so is well I had to wait through all these presentations to get down to the serious business um, I think about it exactly the opposite uh, I'm in the infrastructure business along with my friends Steve and Derek and, and really the whole team Infra being the prefix for beneath or supporting structure. We, it's our business, our profession, to build a platform so we can run marathons and so we can have <coughs> human interactions that make this such a wonderful place of which to be a resident. That still puts a big old smile. Okay, so, with that in mind, and I, again, another very good kind of personal privilege from the It's a Small World Department. Uh, it had been 53 years since I last saw Trudy Gardner. We were classmates at the Governor's School in Salem oh, in 1964. Wow. We changed a little. <laughs> <laughs> wow, and then to see us get a, uh, a Ben Miller painting was, was sort of poignant because Ben's wife, Emily Archer Miller, is sort of my goddaughter. She and my daughter, Angie, were best friends. Uh, Emily spent more time at my house than she did at her own up in Chesapeake, so it is a small world. 
But moving on, uh, I always trust that you've done your homework, so I'm given the hour and not going to go into detail except to the extent you want to ask me questions. Uh, it's very exciting and very much our honor to be a part of your bold and, and, uh, and diligent stewardship programs over the town's infrastructure. Uh, we've recounted what's been going on in the last couple of years. Uh, it'll be like, what, 1868 or whenever they drove the golden spike when one day we'll finally paint the golden edge line on the multi-use path here in about two and a half or three months, hopefully. And uh, that will be truly a great thing. They got a great start, and then they had some setbacks, and now the momentum is back. And uh, I'll say no more about that to say that we're satisfied with the progress. Thank God for daylight savings time and uh, film at 11, or film in May or early June. Uh, so what we have before you tonight is uh, some changes in our our recommendation format. It had been that we give you a recommendation for this coming year and then we sort of hold out what the second and third year might look like. If you've studied this in some detail, you'll see we've done that. Plus, we've laid out what the on-deck circle might look like for the remaining years in a program that would get us out of the business of having any streets that rated poor. And at least be catching them just as quickly as they turn poor. So, I'd respectfully like to ask you to think about these things long term. Uh, you've been noticing the slight increase in the tone of my little pleas that we might need a little more money each year. Uh, turn the burner up on that one just a teensy bit here. It's it's hard to do eight or nine hundred thousand dollars worth of work uh, with an annual funding in the six hundred thousand dollar level. Merit has been great in getting us some grants. Uh, sometimes we can do holistic projects together with water funding and, and, and get more bang for our buck that way. But at the end of the day, I think we're, we're pretty much at the time when, when the board ought to at least consider, with the many other priorities you have to weigh, of ramping up our annual funding for our street drainage projects. Um, I also, one more commercial, um, think that uh, we've got some major scale drainage issues that are listed amongst the road projects. We always do little local drainage as we do the street projects. Every time we leave a street project, hidden underground out of sight is a drainage improvement that will make that area more resilient to sharp storms in the future. But there are some bigger scale projects, roughly parallel in a way to the PATH project, and again, my, my favorite is the memorial backbone system. Details about that in there. We can continue to every now and then drop another phase of it in and amongst the road projects for one year or one half year. Or maybe there's some interest in, in looking at some way to accelerate the funding on that. I'll be more than happy to talk to you collectively or any other way if there's interest in pursuing that further. And I'm sure the staff uh, will as well. But there's good stuff here. We've made great progress, but, but uh, stuff continues to wear out, so we have to stay steady after it to uh, keep that progress in a positive net direction. The project that we recommend to you for fiscal year 1819, which begins in uh, a little over three months, is Whispering Pines. It'll be the biggest non-water project that we've done. It will fix 18% of our suddenly enlarged backlog of four streets because Steve and uh, Commissioner Hoven and uh, Jerry uh, Froelich uh, got out and, and updated the uh, every five-year street evaluation program and uh, of our 60 miles or 63 miles counting gravel of street, we found that three point something dropped into the poor category, and that's just normal wear and tear. So, uh, we now have um, uh, around six miles in four, and uh, this will take care of about 18% of that. So we think it's a good choice. We present it to you with the usual budgetary recommendations and our proposal. We look forward to getting after it quickly if you, if you see fit to approve it. And uh, 
in subsequent years the other projects behind that. I'll stand by for questions now. Thank you, Pete. Questions? I don't have any questions, but I, I want to um, just say I enjoyed once again like uh, going out and helping evaluate the streets like we did uh, five years ago. Um, I think we were out four days. Is that right? No. Four, five. Five. I missed one because I was sick. I, and that was the one where they did my streets. So I wasn't able. To, I wasn't able to say this really needs done. Uh, it happens to be on the list for the for the following uh, fiscal year. I didn't have anything to do with it. Um, but um, I'm trying to remember, uh, Steve, if you s said something like if we continue to do um, the improvements like we have been and maybe help a little bit more with the money that in maybe even seven to ten years we might be able to just be doing overlays on streets. We can get every all, get all the streets done, get the drainage done, and get up to a point where we're not going to need a million dollar budget at that point because the streets will be solid and done in the right way that it will just be resurfacing um, whenever need be without having to do all the construction and the drainage and everything all over again. So I think we're heading in a great direction. That would be good to see in like 10 years or so that we have a much smaller budget for streets. And I appreciate your leadership in this because I know when you came on board years ago um, it was your uh, philosophy this is how it should be done and we bought into it and I'm glad we did. Thank you for that. I think um, in the packet especially when you get to page two or four when you're looking at these charts and anyone's looking at that at home and you look from a historical perspective of um, the length that used to be done historically and where even just over the past you know, five, six years, the commitment that the board's had to making significant improvements and getting us where we need to be, it, it really has been pretty <coughs> substantial. You know, the reason is um, 2008, what, 780 <laughs> feet is to, we've been averaging in the 20,000 plus, so pretty significant. Thank you for all of your hard work and the committees. That's what I was going to comment was I think that uh, I think uh, a thank you is in order for uh, Commissioner Hogan and his committee uh, on all the hard work that they've done. I think it's also important that uh, in looking at this particular proposal, you have five hundred and thirty-eight thousand dollars in street repairs, and uh, you have three hundred and forty-three dollars in thousand dollars in drainage improvements. And you have forty thousand dollars in water lines replacement. Um, so it's not just about streets; it's actually doing it the right way and doing it the smart way. Um, uh, and I feel it's uh, important to point out. I, I was so impressed with your presentation that you had written and given to us, Pete. Um, I, I think you hit the nail on the head: fixing our poor streets before they deteriorate uh, to where a moderately uh, expensive overlay becomes an expensive reconstruction. Reconstruction is just good stewardship uh, of the money, of the of the streets, and the infrastructure of the town. I think it's an excellent proposal. One question too: How long is has the town been using the holistic approach of like we're doing the multi-use path of addressing streets, water, kind of everything at one time to be as less impactful as possible for residents? Is that something that's new, or is it? long-time practice. Commissioner Winley, I would say about um, about 10 or 12 years. Uh, you know, we're not perfect at that. Uh, we were kind of headed that direction in uh, Ocean Acres, but we just couldn't quite get everything together to do the water lines at that time. They're asbestos, so we'll catch them last when maybe they're coming around close to being due for street improvements again. But we started pressing that idea in the 07-8 time frame and have been pretty, not 100%, but probably 90% of the opportunities we have, we look and see what water needs to be done. In fact, if a project has asbestos water mains, that sort of helps it up on the priority list because you know, we, 
We used to have about 145,000 lineal feet of asbestos water main. We're under 100,000 now. We're, we're down in, in the upper 90s. So we've got about a third of them knocked out. So, um, you know, why, why torture our, our public, our residents, our citizens and guests with the construction? Our contractors do a good job of managing their projects by and large with sympathy and concern and consideration for the citizens, but it still isn't the same as a finished project. And, and so in a given 25-year period, let's get them once, not twice. Motion would be in order um, for the two items reference, reference in the packet related to um, the 1819 fiscal year street recommendation as well as for budgeting purpose the recommendation for 2019 uh, 2020. So is there a motion for these two items that are mm -hmm. presented in the packet? Do we read them out or I can just? You can reference packet, yeah. or you're welcome to read them aloud. Okay. Um, I make our recommendation that we uh, approve the uh, numbers one and two as listed on the uh, as directed by staff. Is that fair enough? That's that will work. Right. <laughs> There's a motion and a second. Um, any other discussion? All those in favor? All those in favor, please signal saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thank you again. Thank you, Pete. Thanks, Steve. And thank Steve your staff once again. Thank Derek. Thank everybody else. Okay. New business item number four is the system development fees. We've got Pete and Steve and Derek. And Beth. And Beth. And Beth. <laughs> yes. I guess first we're going to talk about the water system development fees. Yes. This is necessary because of um, legislation that was passed in 2017, House Bill um, 435. I'm sorry, 436. And um, the, what you have in your packet. Um, is the two studies um, that were done, the water systems, um, mainly with the uh, heat and the engineering firm, and then the wastewater was um, done with Steve and Derek with, um, of course, Beverly's help on both from the financial standpoints. But what this information does is it justifies our, what we used to call our initial impact fees for our water services. That's the amount that you pay. Um, to connect to the system, it's your impact on the system, and very simplistic. What this has done is justify that amount. It shows um, how that amount um, is determined that it um, does cover that um, cost um, or that um, I don't know the burden is the right right word to the system. Um, sort of a, a term rational nexus is um, what we remember from the past when we were looking at initial hookup fees. Basically what Pete's um, work has done is shown that the town is in line with the $4,000 that we currently charge. There's actually some wiggle room. And as you all um, recall, we do have a water system um, master plan that we've been following. That's one of the reasons um, like Pete alluded to, we've been able to get rid of the asbestos pipes. We've enlarged some of our water lines um, for increased fire protection. And um, the boards, the previous boards and, and this board has been very good in and continuing to follow that master plan. So with that being said, um, our the new term that will be used is um, systems development fees. So you'll see that in the budget as opposed to initial hookup fees. Um, that we will continue to recommend the four thousand per um, unit for single family. Then um, our sanitation district, the Ocean Acres Wastewater System Development, 
same, same thing. You've got to show that what you're charging um, is justifiable. We currently charge $13.50 per gallon, and um, in the work and the calculations that was done, it was determined that this amount needs to be reduced to $12.31 per um, gallon, which we feel would comply with the requirements in House Bill um, 436. The, um, what we're asking for you this evening is for the board to schedule the water system development fees and wastewater system development fees um, analysis for a public hearing on Monday, June the 11th, with public review periods beginning on Friday, March 16th. There's a week five day review period. Um, I recommended this date because this would be the date for your budget public hearing. You know, just felt like they kind of tie together. I'm going to give a little bit of additional review time. And with that, I'll ask the team if they've got anything else to say. Mine was a very simplistic review. They've spent a lot of time and a lot of hard work um, putting this together. I want to thank them all. And so this requirement then to do this every five years, this is new based on the House Bill? 436. 436, right. <laughs> okay. So that's why, I mean, before we were using study and diligence to come up with the yes, figures, but don't. it wasn't a public requirement to have a public we're hearing and to post the 45-day. Right. right. So we were doing the work. Now we have to make it official procedurally with this yes, kind of The action. interesting thing I find about wastewater is the amount that we feel we can justify is less than what the Utilities Commission allows um, a public or private, um, a private utility to charge. We, being a public utility, we're not regulated by the Utilities Commission. I just, I think it's interesting. I, um, I don't know that that was thought, thought through very well in, in Raleigh. Yeah. I agree. But it helps us justify this. We're comfortable. Mm -hmm. even, even though it is a reduction in what we've, what we've already paid for it, we feel that we can justify it. <clears throat> So the action of the board tonight is truly to schedule the public hearing for Monday, June 11th, and we would start the 45-day review period on Friday, this coming Friday, March 16th. Yes, okay. Any and I think, it's, I think it's, um, Pete um, said in his very detailed um, memo that that would continue to give the team um, kind of an opportunity to continue to post some of this information, to continue to get even more of a comfort level. But, what you, what you see, I think, is pretty much what, what, how it's going to end up. And just as a timeline, uh, stat, the state statutes, the G General Assembly has put uh, July 1st of 18. Uh, we have to have this adopted and then our ordinance by July 1st of 18. So that kind of provides a timeline With the budget. to the, That's right, exactly. <clears throat> yeah, hopefully the budget would be adopted. The budget will be adopted in June, and then, of course, that would, would be in effect on um, July 1. Just for a point of reference, does anybody know what Nags Head and Kitty Hawks SDF is? I don't. I don't know what theirs is. I do know that Nags Heads um, charges the same that we do. I'm going to assume Kitty Hawk. Kitty Hawk doesn't collect actually. Dare they, 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 they use Dare, dare County. County. They use Dare. Yeah. Correct. They, they use Dare, so they don't have this same issue. For right. Uh, but Dare County will have to. Correct. To follow Correct. It. And in speaking with the Nags Head manager last week. They are also working on this. They're doing a um, kind of a water systems plan um, like we've done, and they're incorporating this as a part of that. So um, Fair County who provides for Manio, Kitty Hawk, Southern Shores, and Duck, right, well, and obviously College yeah. because we sold that system to them. They will, they will do their study, and then we've done ours, and next. <clears throat> Any other questions, comments? I do, but I can keep the staff. Okay. okay. Um, anyone prepared to make a motion? I make a motion that the Board of Commissioners schedule the wastewater system development fees and wastewater system development fees, Southern Sanitary District, Ocean Acres Wastewater system analysis for public hearing on monday june 11th 2018 with the public review period beginning on friday march 16th 
2018. Second. So motion and a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please signify saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, does anyone have anything for committee reports this evening? <clears throat> Other than I was um, with the uh, bad spell of weather that we had, I missed uh, the crash attack meeting, so uh, I couldn't, couldn't get down here because I had to stay at the ferry committee. But I'm sure that uh, John's got some notes that he can share with us on that. Um, so we did have a, a community appearance commission meeting on February 22nd, and just to reiterate with everybody, if you don't know, Trash Attack is going to be April uh, 21st, Saturday, from uh, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. If there is a rain delay, it will be the 22nd, that, that's Sunday afternoon, I believe 1 to 5. Uh, and by the way, that is Earth Day weekend as well, so there really is a holiday, kind of a, a good weekend, really good weekend to do it. Uh, March 21st, uh, we're going to have our first uh, KDH uh, kicks, I call it the kicks butts uh, subcommittee. It's a subcommittee strictly to address the issues of uh, cigarette butt litter on our beaches and throughout the town. This is a, a pretty rough problem and it's keeping getting worse so we are uh, having our first meeting the 21st. It's the uh, Wednesday after our, this month's planning board meeting, uh, 6 p.m. in this room, to just start a discussion about taking action steps to deal with cigarette butts. Uh, and we're also going to try to work hand-in-hand uh, -hand with surf riders. I know, uh, I know Matt's here, I believe that you guys have a pretty good plan in place with um, cigarette butt receptacles, uh, maybe going out on the beach with some of our trash cans. We want to partner with you guys, really work together to get the best solution possible. Uh, that March Community uh, Appearance Commission's meeting is actually March 22nd, the morning after the Cigarettes uh, Committee uh, meeting, and that will be at 8.30 in this room as well. But everybody, please mark the calendars. Uh, remember, April 21st, 9 a.m., trash attack. Please come out, volunteer, and help us. That's all I have. Did you finish or you were? Yeah, well, no, that's all I have as far as um, <coughs> committee reports. Okay. Uh, just I have some commissioner out here. Okay, great. Circle back in just a minute. Um, anything? Can we get the tourism board? You would do that, maybe? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have tourism board meeting, of course, in uh, February. And uh, it was a pretty short meeting uh, as far as the business we took care of. We did have the presentation. Uh, Dave uh, from the Park Service gave his presentation there, and I asked him after the meeting if he'd come and do one for us, and uh, he was nice enough to do that for us tonight. Um, besides the, all the figures, which I don't have in front of me for uh, uh, revenue and uh, vis uh, visitors coming to the Honor Banks, so everything has been up so far for the last, it was up for last year, and uh, it looks like that trend is going to continue. One thing that I will report is that the tourism or the uh, visitor bureau bought the uh, South Beach Grill property that's across the street from the event site. It closed on that last month, and uh, they're evaluating the building right now to see if it's <clears throat> worth saving for any purpose. And it probably won't be. It's pretty old, but uh, it's going to be used for parking. They're also uh, negotiating on another piece of property which hasn't been come to fruition yet. See how that goes when it does. I'll let you know. Thank you. That'd be nice to have additional parking. <clears throat> All right, we'll move on to commissioner's agenda. Back on you, Terry. <laughs> um, I received a, a letter. I'm sure maybe y'all did also uh, from the Albemarle Commission, uh, talking about the uh, National March for Meals campaign, and it's dealing with the Meals on Wheels. Um, and they have a pretty active campaign on that. The contact person is Audrey Holland. She's the volunteer administrator. Uh, and if anybody wishes to uh, volunteer, they need to get up with her. Um, worthwhile program. Um, also, um, on February, uh, on the 26th, I traveled to Raleigh. And uh, Commissioner Winley and the mayor went. And uh, the mayor uh, made comment. Uh, uh, at the BOEM uh, conference up there, and I just wanted to say that I don't think I've ever seen anybody deliver 
such an effective speech um, and, and address that unit. Uh, you did an outstanding job. Um, it, it was phenomenal to uh, hear some of the things that, that you stated. Uh, and the reason we were there is because we uh, were adamantly opposed uh, to, to that. Opposed another group that uh, deserves recognition, and, and we have Matt here tonight, uh, is the Surfrider Foundation. Um, they organized a lot of the activities and, and put everybody in, in touch with uh, how we needed to address that and how we needed to, to focus our opposition. Uh, and you're, you're to be commended, Matt, as a co-founder. Uh, thank you very much for that. It's a very good uh, group and partnership with the town. Um, the next item that I had was um, I wanted to, to bring up a, a point about a memo that we got from staff about an application. Um, there's been some discussion in the past um, between Commissioner Wimley and I of the possibility of an alternate member on our planning board. We have a lot of people that put in applications and, and want to get appointed to different boards and so forth. <coughs> um, we don't currently offer uh, an alternate member uh, status on the planning board. It may be something that uh, you know would benefit the town and keep people interested if we were able to do that and appoint them as such. So my recommendation at this point would be that, Debbie, we maybe have staff come up with some sort of language uh, to see if that's a possibility to come back to the board that the board would consider wanting to do. Uh, I think there's a benefit to, to doing that. Uh, some people may just, you know, if they don't get appointed to something, they may walk away and, and we not see them. And the alternate planning board member, uh, if they were appointed as that, uh, may get involved with the, the town and, and stay involved. A little history. When I first got involved with the town, I was appointed as an alternate planning board member. And I served in that position. Then as a planning board member, um, I think there's some benefit there. Um, and then the next item that I wanted to bring forward was um, special events. We have a lot of special events in the town um, that, that go on uh, from time to time. Uh, I think one of them that happened was called Mommy and Friend, uh, where they had a yard sale at a, a particular business a couple, three or four years ago. And what happens is we're able to utilize some of these parking areas at some of these establishments for people to set up uh, like a vendor or something to that effect. Um, there's a couple of different uh, activities that happen in our town every year. Um, and what I need to know, or what I want to know, is um, how do we couch special events and people that want to set up tents and stuff like that to sell wares during a specific period of time? Is that caught through the uh, itinerant merchant uh, ordinance, or we, we have a we have a special events ordinance that um, is handled through the planning department? There's an application that would be filled out, and I think particularly Meredith, if I'm correct, Donna works with that. She does the majority of the special events, yes ma'am. So that's, that's, that's able to happen if somebody wants to do that? Right. There's and they can set up vendors and so on and so yes. forth? Yes, and uh, I don't, um, I don't, Meredith, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't <coughs> think that like a yard sale with the mommy and me would fall into that, I don't know. Probably um, because it's not profit. No, no. Our, our ordinance is set up for profit and non-profit organizations okay. and there's different times of years where you can use for-profit vendors versus they have to be all non-profit. Um, the, the special event, we have an application, someone fills it out, they do a sketch plan of what they want to set up. One thing that's required is if, if they are going to use a parking lot at a business, that business cannot be conducting regular business because it's required parking for the regular business. So the business, either it can be inside for the event and utilize the parking lot there, or if they're going to be in utilizing the entire parking lot for an event, the business can't um, also be open and have regular customers because it's required parking for the business itself. So it's kind of a, a give and take for a business to uh, host one of these events um, unless it's inside the building. Uh, Brewing Station does quite a bit inside their building um, during various different group organizations. Um, 
I know that several of our businesses have done that in the past. Some do have outside events, but they have yard areas, so it does not take up any of the required parking. Therefore, they can function as normal because they're not use, utilizing required parking. Casey so, just made a good example. Um, for example, when you see the car washes, you see them at banks right. on the weekend. Absolutely. On the off hours, sure. Right, right. But the, because, because the banks are closed, so, they, so that they're able to utilize that parking. Correct. Right. And if they, if they don't set up in parking lots, if there's a grass area, uh, the brewing station does festival of trees. It's, it's solely in the grass area in the backyard. It's not taking up required parking. So there's a special event. But if someone wants to set up, and the brewing station did this one year, they had a Mommy and Me yard sale where you bought slots, mm -hmm. and they numbered their parking spaces. And you could buy a parking space, two parking spaces, or three parking spaces. And the money went to the Mommy and Me group, but the business, the restaurant itself, was closed during the yard sale um, because it's required parking for the business, so they can't have both um, happen. So that, but the event, the application, they draw out exactly what they want to do, how long it's going to be. It goes to the public services department for any type of trash or street. Um, goes to police departments so the police are aware of it, or if they need a crowd permit or different various things. Goes to the fire department for occupancy, and it goes to the planning department for us to review it with our special events ordinance. So it gets circulated through the town and comes back, and it goes to the health department for sanitation purposes. I, w I wouldn't be opposed to looking at maybe what some of the other municipalities do. Uh, I, I, my personal opinion, I wouldn't be uh, opposed to uh, looking at if we waive fifteen percent of the parking. If, for example, you had 45 parking spaces, you're talking about three parking spaces. Um, how do the other towns deal with it? Maybe you can check into that, Debbie, and then get back to us, and, and let's see what they I don't, do. I don't know how you could waive an ordinance. If you if you waive a percentage of the parking, that that's that's um, in the in the ordinance, the parking okay. ordinance. I don't know how that could, could be done. I would defer to the attorney. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I don't know how they uh, the other towns do it either. Um, I, I, I don't. I don't. I don't so maybe we so, can check. So, sure. See. Absolutely. So um, building code is going to play in at some point as well. Right. Um, right. Depending on what business we're talking about. Well, perhaps we could do two things. You could look into it and then check out laws. And in the meantime, could you also email what our current application and respective ordinances are for review, since we do have yeah mm -hmm. the process in place. And then when we have the conversation again, we're able to compare truly what we're doing and have been sure. doing to maybe what and we have we do have businesses that have excess parking um that can use the parking lot right. and not have to um affect the business hours of it um seagate north kmart air center um they all have excess parking over, or above the required parking so you might see an event there and the business is open. Right. Well, the businesses are open. Well, that's they're using parking that's not required for by ordinance. Would that, be like, would that be like Lowe's and night lights out? Nights like what? What is it? No, Lowe's doesn't right. have excess. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Lowe's does not have excess park excess parking. So how how are they allowed that? Because it's because of what it is. For what? National national. national. I don't know. I'd have to review that application. Okay, well, that's interesting. Okay. 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 Yes, sir. And um, then I wanted to thank Debbie for uh, and staff for the uh, review that they did and, and sent back to us on the uh, bulk waste pickup. That was uh, very enlightening, uh, and that was a question that had come around quite a bit uh, because of Kitty Hawk's actions. Right. So uh, thank you very much for that. That's yes, all, Steve. Thank you. Just to just to recap, and yes. make sure I'm on the um, right track. Understand understand what um, Commissioner Gray is asking for, especially this. Now, the planning board and the um, alternate member, um, as you stated, you you were an alternate member on the planning board. So that being said, obviously it's something that we've had before. The yes, ordinance ma was changed that uh, eliminated that. Is that some? Is that language that the board would like for the staff to bring back to the next meeting? Because 
I love the historical overview because if okay. we had it once and then we did away with it and then but I also think but I don't know I don't know the history did we also only have five members and then we changed to seven full members so I'd love the history okay so that's what we'll as well as the, the, the yeah, yeah, that would be good to say perfect okay so we'll provide you the history and then, and then what we'll, language used to be there back up on yeah. the, uh, the business, um, agenda item you'll instruct me Correct? okay thank you yes thank you. okay great thank you <clears throat> Uh, thank you, staff, uh, for organizing in, uh, the KDH committee reception. And, uh, we're back on the 21st. It was really nice to spend time with us and the uh, other committees and boards and volunteers. Uh, nice event, and I look forward to continuing it in <coughs> next year. Uh, again, you know, it's been mentioned already, but thank you, Sheila, for our speaking at the uh, Bowen Rally last month. Uh, very I thought our channel was well represented there. Thank you, Commissioner Gray. And uh, big shout out to Matt Walker and the Surf Riders for organizing that bus. That was lousy weather that day. I'm so happy I did it for Raleigh. So, uh, uh, very, very nice job. I think uh, it would sell out you know, if you people didn't utilize your tickets. So, uh, our, our community was well represented. You know, it was a fun day and a unifying day, albeit a very worrisome and bad of reason to have to go. Uh, I would like to also mention that uh, Chairman Woodard also spoke on behalf of Dare County and did a, a uh, pretty like, good job as well. Um, I don't know if anybody noticed, but we do have a new grocery store in Kildare Hills now. Everybody's been out to see it yet. Uh, you know, public's open, and I wanted to mention, you know, we got to go on their tour the day before they opened. They made a $5,000 donation to the Dare Education Foundation. I didn't know that was going to happen, but it was really generous and uh, really, really nice uh, first start, first day with our community. Uh, they do, they are offering plastic bags, but I do want to also commend, and I think you mentioned this as well, they really are pushing those reusable plastic bags. I mean, every time I've gone in there, I have to look, I know the bags at home, you can stop, I have enough of them, and, uh, but they really are, I guess, uh, promoting sustainability there. Uh, I think I heard um, from their uh, manager that they had given out 25, um, 25, which just seems crazy oh, to me. Yes. 25,000 of those bags, yeah, since they opened. I don't know if there was an extra zero there. But anyway, oh, no, it's but that's a, a but they had number. ordered more boxes, and I mean, it was, I'd say, probably another 80 boxes that it looked like were stacked. I don't know how many come in the box, but. Um, it's a lot of bags. It is a lot of bags. There's no reason to go around here. Right. So, so I, I, I maybe it could be that many. Yeah. It could be. Anyway. That's a busy place. It is. Yeah. It seems funny. Yeah. All day. Uh, last thing I have to share is this morning, uh, I got to attend the Chamber of Commerce this community housing meeting. Some people may remember if you were at this meeting last month, uh, Karen Brown came to talk about it. Uh, the community housing initiative is still in the uh, getting started stages. There's no, I can't say there's like any definite concrete plans to report, but a lot of good information is being shared. Uh, all, a lot of major players in the com community around community housing are there participating. I, I think that there's a lot to be hopeful about with the, uh, the, the Chamber's housing, community housing meeting. Yeah, uh, I talked to Mary this afternoon that they were putting together a presentation for me to give on the dog park and uh, in the interest of giving them a little more time and also saving a little bit of time tonight, um, I asked her if we could do it at our next meeting. We'll have uh, a few visuals for it and uh, uh, outline where the dog park is going to be, which is over here at Aviation Park. And I just I saw a rough outline of it. It looks pretty interesting. And I'll bring that uh, bring that with me at the next meeting. And did uh, anybody see the video for this golf course has been going around? So it's on, it's on Facebook. It's on Facebook. It's on Facebook. It's on Facebook. It's really cool. It was cool. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, if, you know, uh, <clears throat> if you get a chance, go take a look at it. I think maybe we can try to show it at our next meeting. But that, that's all I got. Okay. Thank you. Um, under Mayor's agenda, there's two items well, uh, in your packet, two resolutions. 
Um, the first is a resolution asking North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper to examine the current membership of the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission. Um, and the second is a resolution opposing any adverse change in the definition of a commercial fishing operation. Um, if you recall, back in, um, at our January meeting, we adopted uh, a resolution similar to the, the second resolution, um, but the uh, Marine Fisheries Commission um, redefined some qualifications for the commercial fishing operation. Um, and so there's still with that language, some detrimental language in there. So this is a little, um, I guess, a little more direct of, of a resolution on that topic. Um, and the other thing, based on some of the actions that have recently transpired by the uh, Marine um, Fisheries Commission, that's what's prompting the first resolution, asking the governor, who is the one who appoints the members to the commission, to look at that membership and make sure that the members are comprised of meeting the interest of what the commission is all about, because some of the actions of late seem contrary to what their sole purpose is in being on that commission. So that's the justification for those two resolutions. Um, these have been um, adopted in similar format by Deer County Board of Commissioners and also are being circulated to the other towns as well. Um, so with the board's permission, I'd like to make a motion that we adopt um, both the resolution asking North Carolina Governor to examine the current membership of the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission, as well as the resolution opposing any adverse change in the definition of a commercial fishing operation. I'll second. Any discussion? Questions? Nope. All those Appreciate in favor, please signify saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The only other thing this <coughs> evening, just to, um, I guess, tag along with the trash attack promotion, is to highlight the poster contest that's going on right now. Um, prizes are, these are cash prizes. Mm. We're doing that. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> cash prizes for first, second, and third um, entries into this. Um, this is a great contest for youth to get involved in their, um, we've had some great posters turned in before. Um, gosh, some of them are now on our, um, our, our trash truck. So um, it's open to all Deer County students, grades K through 12. The um, posters need to be turned in here, upstairs, um, between 9 and 4 by March 28th. So definitely get them in by then. Um, good fun project to do with your youngins in the rain, right? So mm -hmm. anyway, but, uh, we've got posters it's on the website, on our Facebook page, to help spread the word about the poster contest. <coughs> and all of the um, posters that are submitted will be recognized. They'll be judged. Is the Art Council involved in the judging this year, or is the committee doing that? I'm looking at Sue. I don't if it's come know. up, okay. Well, they'll be judged, awarded, and then we'll recognize um, the uh, recipients at a future meeting. So. Okay, that's all I have this evening. We'll move on to town manager's agenda. Nothing this evening, thank you. Town attorney? Nothing for me, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, consent agenda. Then? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Consent agenda um, this evening. First item is the minutes from the February 12th, 2018 meeting. The second is um, the proposed budget for the government and education access channel. Um, as you heard earlier this evening, that is a hundred. Um, excuse me, that's a thousand dollar membership fee. Um, number three is the budget amendment that we had received consensus from the board earlier um, last month. Thank you very much. And this is to provide funds to purchase a new police department canine training and kennel. Number four is a recommendation for this 2017-18 lease purchase agreement. Total amount to be financed is one million eighty-three thousand four hundred forty-seven dollars and forty-seven cents. Um, this is at an interest rate of two point six four percent, with eight semi-annual payments. With BB&T submitting the lowest overall financial cost. Number five is the Glenmere and Ferris Avenue funding provisions. The proposal for improvements to the Glenmere and Ferris Avenue Beach Access will be received on Thursday, March the 15th. The town has received grant funding from both the staff, uh, excuse me, from both the state of North Carolina um, for these improvements, and our matching funds must be transferred from our reserve fund to the necessary expenditure line. We're asking um, 
for this to be approved this evening so that we don't hold up the project before our next meeting um, to allow for me to expend those funds necessary from the capital reserve combined with the grant funds um, will equal the amount of the proposed um, improvements to Glenmere and um, Ferris Beach access. And then lastly is the January 2018 monthly reports and staff recommends approval of the consent agenda as submitted in a motion would be in order. So moved. Second. Any discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, for all of those who have stayed with us at the end here, we're back to the second time that's set aside for public comment. Is there anyone who wishes to speak? Matt, go ahead, jump up. <laughs> Matt, and welcome. <laughs> you don't have to run, it's okay. <laughs> Um, Matt Walker, co-chair of Heart Foundation. I just want to say, and both, I did want to say this before the thank yous, but continue to love this, love this. Thank you guys for all your help, um, particularly to the rally last weekend. You guys have been supported the whole time, and um, I agree that the uh, the honorable wait, the honorable doc wait, honorable doctor, doctor oh, exactly did a great job. Um, <laughs> I also have to share the credit though. It was seriously the NCO, all these groups going to doing that, and uh, the federation federations, particularly, especially when it came to the bus, like they organized that whole thing. So they get full credit for that. Well, and so Mike Flynn, Coastal Federation, thank you. Next stages, we won't hear anything until November. So um, really, from here on out, it's kind of a, a apply pressure where you can thing. Locally, we'll have hands across the sand on May 19th. We're still putting that together, but that's definitely more of a visual. Just continue to show of opposition. In addition to that, we're hearing that the thing that people can do is apply pressure to um, elected officials and the DOI. So that's uh, Senators Tillerson Burr, the White House, and uh, the DOI that need to hear it loud and clear because they'll, you know, the, pop, the public comment period is over, but of course, those people would still get that message and, and share it. So those are key. Um, we're more than welcome to help, help you on, on trash attack. Litter campaign seems like a big issue. Maybe a current TV spot before the tourism season might make help in terms of telling people to get a reusable bag or don't throw a cigarette butt or you know, use less plastic, et cetera, et cetera. Just a thought. And then um, then finally, in the interest of accuracy, actually the sandbars aren't very good right now. I didn't want to harsh that guy's mellow. The correlation is not causation. Who knows anything? Hopefully they'll be killer by summer, but so the grapevine doesn't get a hold of some erroneous sort of, yay, everything's killer now. Not right now. Cross your fingers for the next few months. And um, that's it. Thank you guys again. Seriously, been, thank you, Matt. it's a big deal. The change in the last few years of seeing how our local, everything is just, it's full speed ahead. And it's really nice to see because it's going to take all, all that and, and everything else. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? No takers? Okay. Well, thank you all for staying with us. I guess a motion to adjourn is in order. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> All right. Stay safe. Get him safely. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for being here. <laughs>